It's 8 o'clock on today. Coming up, speaking out. President Biden delivers a high-profile speech at the U.N. weighing in on Iran and Ukraine. Russia alone has the power to end this war immediately. Secretary of State Antony Blinken joining us earlier this morning. Ukrainians are fighting for their own country, for their own land, for their own future. The Russians are not. We're live with the latest. Then, royalty in 1A from the world stage. We have to act in the service of future generations. Because what we do today is about tomorrow, too. To right here in our studio, Queen Rania of Jordan is here live to talk about some of her most important work and major milestones for her family. Plus, voice lessons. We're sitting down with the coaches, including newcomer and country legend Reba McIntyre. What kind of confidence do you have coming in being the newbie? Absolutely none. <laughs> She's still the queen. Don't get it twisted. Gearing up for season 24 and giving us all the details. And Search Party. Taylor Swift's new game with Google has fans breaking the internet. The star leaving clues, leading to chaos. So what were they looking for? We'll tell you on Popstart today, Wednesday, September 20th, 2023. I'm picking up the stress. Sisters Trim from California, New Jersey, and Florida. From Phoenix, Arizona. Today is Tina's birthday. <laughs> Sending love to her church family. In Columbia, South Carolina. On a girl's trip to celebrate my 36th and my 80th birthday. Shout out to Union. And Parkville, Kentucky. Kentucky. I'm taking out this trip. Carol Mom's birthday trip. From Charleston, South Carolina. And Lawrenceville, Georgia. Hi to our kids, Tiffany and Zach. Watching in O'Fallon, Missouri. From Bel Air, Michigan. Married 41 years today. Woo! We're back, it's 8-12. We were in the presence of royalty. Queen Rania El Abdullah Jordan. She is right here in New York along with her husband, King Abdullah II, for the UN General Assembly. We're going to talk to her about her work, some milestones for her family in just a moment. But first, a little more on Her Majesty. We have to act in the service of future generations because what we do today is about tomorrow, too. An influential voice on the world stage, Queen Rania Al Abdullah of Jordan, is a powerful advocate for causes close to her heart. If we stick together, we can make fixing the climate the greatest project and greatest achievement of our lifetimes. A champion of the environment, Her Majesty serves as a council member for the Earthshot Prize founded by Britain's Prince William. The Queen is also focused on helping the world's refugees, asking for compassion during a keynote speech in London last week. When we demonize people for seeking a better life for their families, we normalize their suffering. For decades, her royal role and humanitarian work have led Queen Rania to meet with foreign leaders and speak at summits. Last September, Her Majesty joined King Abdullah in London for the funeral of Queen Elizabeth. They returned months later for the coronation of King Charles. It was 24 years ago at the age of 28 when Her Majesty received the title of Queen. This past June, she celebrated 30 years of marriage with King Abdullah shortly after hosting not one, but two elaborate royal weddings that captured the world's attention. Their eldest daughter, Princess Iman, married first in a march ceremony. Queen Rania writing on Instagram, I pray this next chapter in your life brings you as much joy, love, and laughter as you have brought us over the years. The country then celebrated the heir to the throne, Crown Prince Hussein, as he married his bride, Rajwa, an architect from Saudi Arabia. First Lady Dr. Jill Biden, Prince William, and Princess Kate were among the 1,700 guests. And if that weren't enough, the king and queen also had the graduation of their daughter, Princess Salma, from the University of Southern California, and their youngest son, Prince Hashem, from high school. Queen Rania posting, guys, can we slow down a bit? This mom needs to catch her breath. Oh, Queen Rania, your majesty, good morning, good morning. I want to get to all of that in just a second because a lot of that we're watching and we think, wow, she's just like us. <laughs> we have those same feelings. But let's talk about the UN first. Um, you know, I feel like the world is in such a dark place right now. Mm -hmm. And I've heard you give speeches and I feel that there is light there. Mm -hmm. Where do you see, where, where do you find that hope and how do you convey it? Well, you know, you're right. I think I think our world is an inflection point, you know, and 
it seems like polarization is really a defining feature of our world. You know, mm -hmm. whenever we see somebody who disagree, disagrees with us, it's become natural to demonize them. Yeah. And when you see everything through a political lens, it becomes very difficult to come together over any issue. Mm -hmm. And the irony is that the issues that we're facing today, from climate change to migration to inequality, those all need solutions that come from collaboration. So if we're not talking to one another. You know, we're not going to be able to um, to find resolution to some of these issues. And I, and I just feel like we need more engagement that is rooted in optimism and hope yeah. rather than, you know, fear. And, you know, there's, there's this wave of populism around the world that's using people's fears and insecurities for leaders to gain popularity, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that's not finding, that's not very helpful. It's not finding solutions. So I think we need to focus more not on the why, for example, mm -hmm. when it comes to climate change, but on the how. Mm -hmm. How do we find so solutions? At the COGEX, you gave, you gave a beautiful speech and you talked about how you used to think that strong leaders were tough and led from the front of the ship. Mm -hmm. But as you've grown, you realize that leaders, great leaders, actually lead from the back of the ship. They're behind, they're watching how things unfold. And in your opinion, those are the kind of leaders who I think get to be a strong leader, you need to follow. Yeah. You know, follow the great movements that actually lead to people's engagement and lead to participation that leads to change. You have to have some self-doubt. What we're seeing today yeah. is so much, I know what I, I called it, you know, certainty on ster steroids, where yeah. you're not questioning yourself and you think that your opinion is right. I think we could all benefit when confronted with an opinion that differs from ours in just maybe replacing defensiveness with curiosity. Yeah. Because you could learn something new. And it doesn't mean you have to agree with the other side, but you can try to find a little bit of a middle ground. And, and the, really, the, the frightening thing in our world today is that middle ground seems to be disappearing. It's yeah, it's we need lost. to regain that middle ground because that is where change is going to happen. And you're optimistic that that can, that can happen. I think optimism is a, is a choice. I don't know if you remember this, but you've been here on this show many times. Mm -hmm. There was one time in particular that you came on when your youngest was four months old. True, yes. Uh, I think we have a little video. This is now 18-year-old Hashim. He just graduated from high school. When you look at those images of him as that little boy and to see what he's become. It's just scary how time flies, <laughs> yeah. right? I mean. I mean, you know, as parents, I think it's our, our job to, you know, take care of our kids until they are old enough to <laughs> go out into the world. But it doesn't make it easy when that day comes, actually. And, you know, in the span of three months, from the end of March to the beginning of June, I had two children get married and two graduate. Oh, gosh. I mean, you're I mean, about what, to be an empty nester. What was nest? I thinking? <laughs> you're, so you're an empty nester, so to speak? I'm an empty nester right now, you know, and it, it's... Uh, but, you know, it's just this wave of emotions, you know, with Iman when mm -hmm. she, it was a new experience for our family because she's the first one to get married. And mm -hmm. there were so much, so much planning and anticipation culminated in a really beautiful and emotional day. Nothing can prepare you for the moment you see your daughter in that white dress. Oh. You know, the mixture of emotions of, you know, pride at the strong and independent woman she's become, joy for her joy, sadness for her leaving home. Mm. You know, it's, it all comes together and nothing can prepare you for that. Well, just to brag on your kids a little bit, uh, Crown Prince Hussein went to Georgetown in the Royal Military Academy in England. Princess Iman started in Georgetown, then transferred to New York's Parsons School of Design. Princess Salma graduated from USC, yes. and now your, your son is off to college. Yeah. You did good by all your kids. Can I ask one thing? one thing that we wrestle with here when it comes to our kids, mm -hmm. kids and cell phones. I know this is off topic, but mm -hmm. what, what, what is, what's that like in your house? Is that something that you don't like to have around your kids being on Look, their phones? I don't think you can completely fight the trend because that's where children are. I mean, that's where the world is. Technology is all around us. You can't find it completely, but you need to regulate it. Yeah. And I think it's more about the values that you instill in your kids you know, uh, about themselves, the yeah. self-confidence, the, 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 the discipline, all those mm -hmm. things are important and that will determine how they interact with their technology. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, one of the first things when, um, just before my son announced his engagement, I took Rajwa to a side and the first thing I told her was, you know, there's no such thing as a 100% approval rating. You're yeah. always gonna have people that are against you. And the advice that I wanna give you is please try not to read the comments. Yeah. You know, because that's just gonna, you're just gonna have self-doubt. You're yeah. just gonna, and when, when you, there's always gonna be negativity, and that negativity is coming 
it's not, it's not about you. It's from the person. They're unhappy in their yeah. own lives. So don't carry that unhappiness. Just keep focusing on what it is you want to do because it'll shake your confidence. You, you, you think it's not going to affect your morale, but it does, it does. you know? And, and so you just need to develop healthy habits around technology. And, and that's what you try to teach your kids, not to stay away necessarily from their phones, but to interact with them in a, in a healthier way and to always establish that balance. Well, you've done so well by your children and also just by just the way you're navigating your way through the world and how you're helping everyone. I just want to say thank you. It's been in my honor to sit with you, uh, Queen Rania. It's thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Deals, Steals, and Deals is sponsored by Wells Fargo Credit Cards. Credit cards made for the way you live. That's real life ready. And we're back with Steals and Deals from fashion to home to uh, just a cool way to get around. We've got it all covered and more. And we've got a special treat for our viewers. Everything today has free shipping. How did you swing that? Lifestyle and Wow, one, whoa. Brooks. How did you even <laughs> do that? Scan the QR code. You know the drill. Wow. I know. First I'm of all, so. I love seeing you. How are you? I'm good. Okay. I'm good. And right. I, I'm so excited because normally I match my outfit to the theme. Yes. You I do. was like, what is free shipping? Here yes. we go. Just okay. excited. Okay. So let's start. With, I can't believe this. I mean, this is a triumph. First of all, I went around the Grand Canyon with an e bike. This is the thing because you can either use it as an e bike, which yeah. means that it powers you or you can actually pedal. So this okay. is the Radio Flyer M880 electric bike. The retail price, $1,799. Wow. It goes up to 20 miles per hour and up to 50 miles in distance on a certain charge. Okay. Charge the battery, power on the bike. You can choose pedal only, the five level pedal assist or throttle only, which you see up here. Yep, if you can yep. zoom in I on see that. All those things. The brand says it features high intensity LED headlights, Integrated taillight with brake light, reflectors, automatic motor cut mm -hmm. while braking, and integrated bell. Mm -hmm. So it's got a digital LCD display with the sp speedometer, odometer. Look online for all oh, the different Oh, the bells features. and whistles, Yeah, though. comes wow. in different colors. I just want to say assembly is required, but it's not over the top. Right, right, can, right. But I just want to, it do doesn't it. come like this. The deal price is $719. We don't have a lot of them. That's 60% no off. That's so a, if you wanted to dip into like the e-bike world, it's... And that's a $1,000 off. It's that's very cool. crazy. Take us to the water bottle we need. Jill. Okay, so this is the Dylan 32 ounce water bottle with two diffusers. Retail price, $69.98. Okay. So what's different about this, mm -hmm. it's um, a wide mouth. The brand says the bottle, it's stainless steel, mm -hmm. dishwasher safe, and has triple layer vacuum insulation that keeps water cold up to 24 hours. Wow. So that's a lot, 24 hours. Yeah. Okay, and it comes with two alk... I, I can't say this word. Alkalinizing. Okay, I don't know what that means. Diffusers, okay. but right. what it means is the brand says it'll make the water less acidic. Oh. So it comes with those two diffusers, but you could use it with that if you want it less acidic, or you can use it without Regular. it. 
The deal price is $29. That's 59% off. And it's very substantial. I, I like that a lot. What is this, a diffuser? Yeah. So I this love is, the scent. Yeah, yes. So you know when you walk into a hotel or into a room and you're like, what, what is, that? is that? The Canopy Aroma Diffuser Starter Set, the retail price is $90. So it comes with notes of sweet bergamot, earthy tea blossom, or use your own favorite scent. Comes mm -hmm. in four colors, has three um three speeds, mm -hmm. um, one diffusion well, one unwind oil, and one aroma puck. So mm -hmm. you dip a few on there, a few dip drops. A couple drops. And then it goes uh, within 400 square feet. So it'll really fill the room. Mm. Um, and it, it does mm. set the tone. It's like a candle, it but it's, you know, reusable. Great. Deal price, 40 bucks, 56%. We love a cozy throw. Okay, so if we Which, could just oh show, my will God. you open this Give me one? A, yes, I the, will. How it's big oversized, it is. yeah. So it's mm. Malibu Lux. These blow out, so whichever you like, just... Get them now. This is huge. Throw a blanket, Look 170 to 185. Um, okay, so it's oversized. It's 50 by 70, mm. which is a big family mm. blanket. Machine wash cold, gentle cycle. The deal price, $59, up to 68% off. This is like your go-to. Three people under it watching a movie. That's uh, what that is. I mean, binge watching blanket. And this is a new pattern for them, the okay. checkered, which is cool. All right. Okay. The Volo Beauty Ultimate Self-Care Essentials Bundle. The retail is $78.33. This is an exclusive bundle just for us. Oh. And it's um, four pieces. You get the Hero Hair Towel, mm -hmm. which absorbs um, water quicker, okay. like that. less frizz, not pulling, spa headband, scrunchie, and mm. face towel. Mm. So this is like everything you need for a spa night. Mm -hmm. Great way to refresh, cleanse that uh, that closet, and bring these in. Um, drying time by 50% reduces it. Boom. So uh, deal price $39 <gasps> for the four piece, 50% oh, off. Oh, let's get some jammies. Okay. Come on. So this is like my dynasty days. Like <laughs> you want to go out in this, you do you with a pair of heels and jewelry. But it's a lounge set, the retail, $350. It's an oversized cut shirt with an elastic waistband. So you see wow. there's a lot. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I'm mm -hmm. like pulling her over. Mm -hmm. um, and it's jump sizing, so it's easy. It comes in small, medium, large, extra large. You could see the sizing. The deal price is $69. That's 80% off. And for this, I mean, this is the new trend now, like sort Love of it. wearing your pajamas Love out, it. which I'm all for. Yeah, of course you are. And free shipping. Will you run through the deals one more time? I would love to. Okay. Radio Flyer, if it's still left, electric bike, the Dylan 32-ounce water bottle with two diffusers, the Canopy Aroma Diffuser Starter Set, the Malibu Luxe Throw Blankets, the Volo Beauty Self-Care Essentials Bundle, and the My Lounge Body Lounge Set. Wow. Got it, Jill. You got it all covered to shop that and find more exclusive skin or QR code or head to today.com slash deals. Thank you, Jill. We've got a Blake replacement. It's another country legend, Reba McIntyre. NBC's Kaylee Hartung sat down with our first-time coach and the rest of the coaches. Hey, Kaylee. 
Hey guys, you can imagine how much fun this one was. So as another group of talented singers vie for the title of The Voice come Monday, the competition among these coaches will heat up too. Blake Shelton leaves the show, the winningest coach of all time, and Reba, a legend in her own right, knows she has some big cowboy boots to fill. <laughs> If you did choose me as your coach, you know we'd have a blast. Oh, it's like a son to me. Oh, my God. What kind of confidence do you have coming in being the newbie? Absolutely none. <laughs> uh, she's still the queen. Don't get it twisted. Yeah. They're being so sweet, teaching me, guiding me. I couldn't do it without them. They've been giving you some tips. They have. Filling the shoes and the seat for Blake Sheldon. I got to do him proud. As The Voice tries to figure out life after Blake, Gwen, what is going on back in Oklahoma? My life is all about Blake. Uh, <laughs> I get to go home to that. It's really different being on the show without him. I miss him so bad on the show, you know what I mean? But at the same time, it hasn't been as hard as I thought it was gonna be because I think he was just so ready to have a break that it was kind of weighing on me the last season we were on there. Oh, poor Blake! This will be in the tabloids. I still really love being on the show. And you took a break. Yes, one season. One season, just one season. I wanted now to have a chance to win while I was gone. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> let, me, yeah. let me ask John this question. John, when was, John, when was the last time? No, 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 we're just not getting into details like that. In the season that you took off, you guys doubled the number of kids yes, in the house. Yes, we have four now. <laughs> That's so crazy. If I take another season off, we'll have eight. <laughs> <laughs> you have to tell her about my dream. You have to. Also, Gwen tells me, you know, I just had a dream about seeing Chrissy holding two babies that were kind of like the same age, but they were like not exactly twins. This is in December. Before you had the you had Before the we had one. Esty. So Esty came in January and Ren came in June. And I hadn't told anyone we were uh, uh, having a baby with a surrogate in June. And Gwen had a dream for seeing this whole thing happen. Wow. <laughs> hey, Gwen, am I going to win? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you this competition. Sleep, I'll let you know. <laughs> Gina Miles! In his freshman season, Niall takes the trophy. Team Niall for the win! Yeah, thank you. Don't clap too loud, it's all right. There's, there's something it's called a thoroughly. sophomore slump. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm very much looking forward to Never heard of it, never heard of it. Very much looking forward to your slump. How much does that season one win motivate you to keep going? Yeah, it's amazing. I got like got lucky with the, the level of talent in my first season. It was crazy. And I feel like I've turned for the right people this season. I've made already made a couple of great steals. I'm feeling confident. I think we all should feel confident uh -huh. about our teams, though. I think that we all have a couple in our team that really have a chance of winning this. OK, everybody has to make a prediction. You cannot choose yourself. OK. Who's going to win this season? I'm going to say we have a lot of country fans yeah. that watch The Voice. And Reba is beloved by all of them. And she's got some great country artists. I could see that working in her favor. I actually said that exact same thing to Reba yesterday. I didn't realize in the blinds that she had that many good people on her team. What do I think? Pick me, pick me. And I'm not. Uh, no. <laughs> Reba's looking for the sweep. <laughs> well, we thought the Shelton was going to win his last season on The Voice, didn't that we? Was that's shocking. You know what I mean? That was shocking. Yeah, you just slid right on in there. John's team is crazy. Oh, oh, the same actually way. actually my name. No, I do. No, I, I really do think you do. As I have found out, it doesn't matter about the blind auditions. It doesn't matter about the battle rounds, knockout rounds. It's a crapshoot. Yeah. Anybody could win. And that's what makes this show so much fun to watch as we gear up for now 24 seasons and counting. Guys, the coaches tell me there have already been tears from them, tons of emotion as they make the hard, sometimes they say even ruthless choices between contestants. So get ready for the ride. Oh, we ready. Oh, thank you, Kaylee, for uh -huh. sitting down with them. One fun fact is that Reba loves tater tots. Oh, <gasps> loves tater tots. Oh, yum. So in this season, you'll see when someone makes it on her team, they get Reba's tots oh. right then and there, right on the set. Oh, that's little, how she's getting contestants yeah, yeah, to go to Reba's right. team. That's, that's right. right. Oh. The power of the tot.
right, friends, we're back with Today Food and the legendary Martha Stewart. Only a few days left before it's officially fall, so Martha's here to show us what we've all been dying to know how to do, and that's preserve our fresh summer tomatoes. So you can enjoy them in the dead of winter. Martha, always good to see you. Nice to see you. And uh, How many Americans store their tomatoes to use in the dead of I winter? I think more than you think. Is this a popular thing, or are we going to teach America Preservation how to do that? Preservation is popular. I understand and, uh, that. Ask the bowl jar company. They make the canning jars. They make for this. And for this, and it's a, it's an old company that's been doing this for many years. Grandma Roskowski, my, gra my maternal grandmother, yeah. taught me how to can tomatoes. Okay. So when you have a lot, and I have tons of tomatoes, I have hundreds and hundreds of tomatoes, uh, make an X in the bottom. Yeah. And now it's very important to make this X because once you put it into boiling water, uh, the skin starts to come off. Now let's see. see. Oh, yep. you have to peel see the skin the, off. See how the skin oh, just okay. comes right off? Yeah. Put it in ice water. Why do you want to stop that process? Uh, you want to stop the cooking because the cook oh, yeah. you don't want to you burn want to get your fingers. Yeah. Okay, so then you... Put it in ice water. Martha, are these tomatoes that only have a few days left to live sort of thing? Yeah, well, how, preserving can, you, them how or? can a family eat that many tomatoes in a couple days? And you can eat jars of tomatoes all winter long. That's true. Right? And you might want to make your tomato sauce. You want to make your uh, your pasta sauces. You want to do your stews, okra stew with fresh, uh, mm -hmm. fresh canned tomatoes. So then look how simply these peel right off. Right. And once you get all the skins off, you cut the tomato. Here's we have one this done quite already. Quite the process here. Huh? Well, it's a fun process. You cut the tomato in half crosswise. Okay. Yeah. And then try to get out as many seeds. Now, why as do you, you want can. to take the seeds out? Well, when canned tomatoes, generally you want the flesh, you want the pulp, you don't want the you seeds. Don't want the seeds. And the seeds might be a little bit bitter. So you just take these out. What would a human do with these leftover seeds as it well, as what in order I do, not to waste? Well, what I do, after I get this whole bowl, I put it into a colander or yeah. a strainer. And Feed it to the animals? No, then I make a juice. Oh. And I have delicious tomatoes. Why don't tomato. you give it to your Hamptons chickens? Well, but I want to drink the juice. Okay. And they make the best Bloody Marys Ooh, you have now ever we're talking. That would have been a better demo than okay. Bloody Mary. So you okay, have how, all so then these how do we, yep. beautiful tomatoes. Yep. And yep. then you have sterilized jars. These must be sterilized okay. for about 15 minutes in boiling water. Okay. Look at this great funnel. It's a canning funnel. See that? Who doesn't have one of those? Well, you, it comes with the jars and yep. the whole process. Yep. You stuff the jar with all these seeded and cleaned and skinned tomatoes. Okay. See how nice? Yep. You're not getting your fingers dirty. I don't want to watch you. Okay. How many tomatoes can you get in one jar? A lot. You can and more than more you than think. six. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh. It depends. Well, it depends on the size of the tomato okay. too. And once you get that, then use some of that excess juice mm -hmm. that that you have uh, wow. found with your tomatoes. Fill it up. What are you? Are you freezing this? Like how long does no, this no, last? No, no. These are canned. So what is? Oh, they just stay They're out. Processed in a in a boiling. Look. The, then you have oh, to make have sure you get all idea. the bubbles. Well, we only have a minute left. Okay. Let's get to okay. The and don't forget a teaspoon of salt. Well, here's a, you need you need like a salt. a meth lab at home okay. to get through this process. I mean. And see, look, you put your jars <laughs> what is in, all this? in Where's here. Mr. White? What and are we you doing? Process. Yeah. And then you make your and cover this over. Okay. Boil this for about 30 to 40 minutes. And, and then what? And then they're good to go? Oh, how long, how long does it sit in the... That can sit for two years. Really? Yeah. And does it like wine? Does it get better? Does it get sweeter? No, or it just stays, stays the, the same. same? Stays as long as it is sealed. And then I make my tomato Why sauce. Why don't we live in jars to preserve ourselves for a couple sauce. of years? Look at this beautiful sauce. It's gorgeous. This is made with onions sauteed in olive oil with carrots and celery and a little bit of garlic. Uh -huh. Add your bucatini yep. pre-cooked into the sauce. Yeah, taste that. How long is this real? This is real. This is, this is definitely real. It's delicious. Isn't it good? Tastes like tomatoes. Yeah. And so what you're not doing is wasting what you have grown. And I, I think it's so important. I have, a, I have a massive vegetable garden and I haven't wasted anything this year. Can you do this with other things or just tomatoes? Oh, well, lots of other well, things. Lots of things. Oh, sure. All right. Well, Pickles. for Christmas, preservation Pickles. kits will be huge this year. Yep. Thank you, Martha. The delicious recipe here for canning and all the tips to do this are, of course, at today.com slash food. Don't forget to check out the Martha Stewart podcast. It's incredible. And we're back with the third and fourth hours of today. But first, a quick check of your local news and weather. Thank you. This morning on the third hour of today, Hollywood ending a glimmer of hope in the months long strike that shut down the entertainment industry talks resuming today. We're live with what it could mean for our favorite shows and movies. Plus, strike a pose. Reminds me of Downward Dog. We'll take you to the zoo where their elephants go to yoga class. But it's not just for fun. The real reason behind this trunk show. 
And then later, Soprano star Jamie Lynn Sigler is here live. We'll find out about her new project with her former on-screen brother. And she's sharing an important message. And then we're shaking things up with some simple cocktails that look beautiful and taste great. That's all ahead today, Wednesday, September 20th, 2023. Live from Studio 1A in Rockefeller Plaza, this is the third hour of today. Ah, good Wednesday morning. Welcome to this third hour of today. I'm Craig. This is Chanel. Good morning. This is Dylan. I haven't seen Hello. you yet this morning. I, feel, I was just about to say thank you. Good morning. Nice. I just good. noticed I did the same thing with Chanel. We're, like, We're all like looking at each other. It's so funny. Yesterday on our radio show, Dylan was like, ah. And I'm like, who are you, Craig? And we spent like five minutes talking about you. Oh, was but, it yeah. nice? It was all nice, but it was just all like nice. what you just all said nice today. Because yesterday, yesterday someone told me that you said that I looked like I was talking on oh, the toilet. Oh, that's right. You did. Oh, you no. did. Yeah. That's true. It, we're good back. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Roker is off all week, enjoying his uh, 12 weeks of contractual vacation. Oh, his jubilee <laughs> with his wife. Yes. yes. Uh, so Their we're, we're going to continue the tradition, though, in, in Al's honor. What day is it? Hump Mike, day. Mike, 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 Mike. What yes. day is it, Mike? Never Home gets old. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it never gets old. Oh, we've got a great That's show lined up. It does yes. not get old. It yes. get and we have some a glimmer of good news to start with this morning. We perhaps, hopefully, fingers are crossed here. Small sign of progress in that Hollywood strike. The writers' union heading back to the bargaining table today with the group representing studios and streaming services. The industry, as you know, has lost billions yeah. during this time. Uh, and a lot of folks are trying to figure out how to pay their rent, how mm -hmm. to pay for food, how to pay for clothes. NBC's entertainment reporter Chloe Malas is here with more. Welcome back. Good morning. Hey Good morning. there. My first hump day with you guys. Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, and it is a very big day. Yeah. We have been 141 days into this writer's strike, and these are the first formal negotiations in a month. Now, these talks could shape the future of the entire Hollywood business and the livelihoods, like you guys were saying, of hundreds of thousands of people that hang in the balance. Today, a pivotal moment in the months-long strike in Hollywood. What do we want? The WGA representing more than 11,000 writers and the AMPTP representing streaming services in studios, including Comcast, the parent company of NBC Universal, sitting down for a face-to-face -face meeting. I mean, anytime you're actually sitting at the table, something can happen. If you're not talking, nothing can happen. The main sticking points between the two groups remain wage increases, residuals in the streaming era, and the use of artificial intelligence. Negotiations are resuming amid the strike that has shut down the entertainment industry for more than four months. Writers pacing the picket line since the beginning of May. Many say they're facing financial distress. People are losing houses. People are losing their car. People are needing to go to food banks. In a letter to its members, the Writers Guild writing in part, our focus is getting a fair deal for writers as soon as possible. A source familiar with negotiations telling NBC News talks are expected to last several days, and the AMPTP is not expected to have revised its previous offer made in August, which is the last time the two sides met, a meeting that was not productive. The impact of the combined WGA and sag after strikes is being felt across the country. The most recent U.S. jobs report showed a monthly decrease of 17,000 jobs in the motion picture and sound recording industries. I don't know how I'm going to pay these last two months rent. And Hollywood's shutdown is now hurting other sectors like hospitality, trucking and dry cleaning businesses, costing the state's economy more than $5 billion. California's Governor Gavin Newsom hasn't been on the picket lines, but he says he's paying close attention. His office telling NBC News while not involved in the talks, Newsom has been engaged in conversations with both sides. He's encouraged they are talking and is hopeful for a resolution. With fall TV schedules feeling the fallout, mostly filled with unscripted programming, all eyes will be on these meetings, including the people behind talk shows that were scheduled to resume in the coming weeks. Bill Maher now pausing the return of his show, a reverse course from his announcement days ago that his show would come back, unfortunately sans writers or writing. Now both sides are hoping there could soon be an ending to this Hollywood drama. 
So these conversations are set to take place in the next couple of hours. And this is a really positive moment Good. to have these sides coming together like this and, and talking, you know, a source telling me that this could take days. Mm -hmm. And so people are just waiting on the edge of their seats to see what progress happens, if any, because like we've been saying, so many people are out of work yeah. and this is just an incredibly dire situation right now. People who yeah. can't pay their bills, they can't pay their mortgages. I mean, it's, it's been so many industries, yes. not just, yes. you know. Yes. Yeah, the jobs report. I mean, mm -hmm. the numbers are just staggering. So, and obviously that even if there's a resolution, um, the ramifications of this, we could see last for quite some time. Mm -hmm. All right. Chloe. Thank you, Chloe. Thank, thank you, you, thank you. Mm -hmm. All, right. All right, well, turning now to some big news from a television icon. Here's a clue. Wheel of Fortune co-host Vanna White is back. Producers announced yesterday that she will continue on until at least 2026. Longtime host Pat Sajak announced earlier this year that the upcoming season will be his last. And Ryan Seacrest will take over hosting duties when the show returns for its 42nd season next year. Willie was actually sitting down with Seacrest for a Sunday sit down when the Vanna White news broke. Oh, that's cool. And he said he's excited to share the stage with Vanna White. And you can catch their full conversation on Sunday morning. That's good. You, you, can't, have, you can't have Wheel of Fortune without Vanna White. Especially if you're changing. It yeah. Needs to, like, there needs to be some consistency. Yes. Yeah. yes. You know, I feel like yes. in, it's comforting to have yes. Vanna White. And right. she's like iconic, right? Yes. So. And she's going to be here in a couple of weeks, by I the way. Oh, get to, yeah, we get to talk to her. Oh, you nice. can show her pictures of your grandmother. That which, was the price is right. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong show. Sorry. You can still show <laughs> pictures of your sure grandmother. I would love to see. Here's right? Doris. Yeah. <laughs> so she would love to see your grandmother because she's so lovely. Hey, you're right. so confident. Too, I know. I was like, oh, uh, sure. What did you were She won all those prizes together. Uh, okay. Well, now to a different kind of puzzle. This morning, have you heard about this? All the oh, yes. you know hipsters downstairs are talking about it. Taylor Swift sent her fans into a frenzy. She partnered with Google to create a word game. It's like move over Wordle. Uh, so yeah. here's an example of what it looked like. Okay, so when you Googled her name this morning, you got a Taylor Swift word jumble about one of her songs, right? So it would look like this. This was all building up to this big reveal. So once fans solved 33 million of these word puzzles, Swift would announce the new song titles. So you don't hear the song, it's just the title from her upcoming album, 1989, Taylor's version. And as you can imagine, it didn't even take that long to reach yeah, that magic they all number. Work together pretty so quickly. So here's Taylor's message to fans. Oh look, you did it. You unlocked the 1989 Taylor's version vault. And now I am so excited to share the new vault track titles with you. They are, is it over now? Now that we don't talk. Say, don't go. Suburban legends. <laughs> That's you. You're a suburban legend. I could, be, <laughs> I could barely contain my excitement. No, there. but seriously, I mean, when you've, made, you've gotten to a point in life where people, 33 million people, just want to hear the name, name of the song. The like, not even song. hear it. So She's we want to try. She's a genius, though. I mean, she, and it's and legit. In every sense of the word, right, she so let's just try it. figured it Are all out. Are you doing out. it now? Uh-oh. Yeah, okay. No, it's on the bottom right. Bottom right. Bottom right. So click that. Oh, look, you did it. You unlocked the 1989 How Taylor's version. How did you guess vault. anything? They just and gave now, it to you. Well, because 33 million people already guessed oh. it. Oh. Oh. We so, love And then it gives you, like, an example puzzle. So, wait, do I hit this right here? Yes. Oh, look, you did it. But you unlocked the 1989 no. Taylor's version. Oh, I tried. You know what? I'm so excited to share people, the new vault the, track the, titles the with hip you. Intern, no, you're not intern. One of our producers. <laughs> Natalie came over. She walked this through. How many times did you show me how to do this this morning? Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. Okay. She helped me like 16 times today. Okay. This is like watching my mother no, no. try to. Downstairs, she was with Veronica. <laughs> it was, tell them, it was Martha Stewart. We were all downstairs. Yes. It was like something record. out of a sitcom. Oh, this is pop. So you want to guess pop record, right? Okay. So you don't have to do bend that. down. We see you. So okay, you okay. Yeah, you can't hide. Then you're going to go in pop okay. record. Yeah. And it comes up like you solved a puzzle. Oh. I was going to say, so you solved four puzzles. Oh. Uh, yeah. We should have had you do it. Yeah. <laughs> Can we also say Natalie is our excellent producer for Clicking with Cal? Oh, so yeah. I didn't yes. know that. Yes. Thank you, Natalie. <laughs> The, Guess what? The album drops next month, October 27th. Seriously, I actually really try. We're going to do Consumer Confidential when we come back, if we come back. Uh, how to protect your data online and why some scammers are trying to get their hands 
in your cookie jar. Yeah, I can explain. talk about this next one, Wellness Wednesday. That I got. Uh-huh, yeah, Wellness <laughs> Wednesday. The healing power of yoga for elephants. Oh. <laughs> Why one zoo is teaching these gentle giants some new moves. Can't wait for Roker to get Why back. Why is it once you turn 40, you can't do stuff? Throw it out today right back after this. You're like, wait, I need... I, I well, I knew you were going to be in trouble. I actually... This morning's Consumer Confidential, how to protect your online data and privacy. If you think a cookie is just a snack, <laughs> think again. Here to share, share up our identities online, we have Jennifer Jolly, nationally syndicated tech life columnist for USA Today. Good morning to you. Hey, Jen. Good morning. So Welcome let's back. start with the cookies. I don't want to take it for granted that people understand exactly what they are. So can you go over that? Cookies are what follow you around online. So a website uses them to store your password or what you have in your shopping cart. It's just a little file that they put on your device. These are normally fine, but third-party cookies can be a huge problem. Third-party cookies, if you click that little lock symbol right in that URL bar, you'll see you know, one site that maybe needs to save your password or something. You'll see that they're tracking 30 to 100 wow. other things. Wow. That Those third-party cookies those that information about you can get sold to data brokers. So should you not allow so, all? You know, there's sometimes you can ask. They but can I say, always allow it because otherwise it doesn't let me go to the website. Or you have to like do 100 things before you get to the it website. It usually does let you go to the website. You, you deny anything that isn't absolutely necessary mm. to go to the website and make the website function. Okay. They're getting better. All of your browsers are getting better at, at a yes or a no. So you can still go to the site mm -hmm. and it only takes a few seconds to deny anything except um, the most important ones. You also want to delete your cookies regularly uh, every three oh, months or so. Point. How do you delete your cookies? You go into your um, browser and okay. it'll sh give you an option. It's really, really simple now. And the reason it's simple is because we need to delete those cookies okay. so that those third party ever third parties don't yeah. track you. It makes your device run slower. Oh. But also, um, you want to use a VPN or a virtual private network and kind of disguise yourself online as well. And so there's easier ways to do that than there have ever been before. Wow, well, I, I feel like I have a lot of work to do. I know. I know. I know. I know. There's so much to get to, but cookies is number one. Okay. okay. Yeah. What about malware? What is that? Malware is um, kind of a blanket term for a code-based program that does terrible things. It attacks your devices, mm. usually to steal information from you, whether it's your uh, social security number, your name, your, your um, uh, any kind of identifying information. So it attacks those devices for malicious purposes. Now, how does the malware get on your device? Usually you accidentally let it in mm. by um, clicking on a site from uh, an unencrypted website or or clicking on a link that someone sends you via yeah. text message or through social media. Mm -hmm. So keep your security settings up to date. Use software and device protection and make sure your device security is toggled on. Those are really critical things to, to protect you online. Social media. I mean, we've, uh, we've talked so much about how much of our personal information is on various social media platforms. Right. What can we do uh, to, to stay safe there? 
make sure that you don't put too much identifying information on social media. Social media has become a real hotbed, especially for AI cyber criminals that mm -hmm. have totally upped the game in fake, you know, malicious uh, marketplace sites and things like that. So only share with people you know, lock down your privacy settings, don't put things like your birthday, um, check your privacy settings every six months or so because every time there's an update, those change, mm -hmm. and then disable non-essential information sharing. Just make sure you're not putting too much out to the world. So oh, important. Yeah, I almost feel like, too, if world. you don't understand it, it's not a bad idea to get your a teen, somebody yeah. in your neighborhood. or Clearly, you know. Yeah. That. Exactly. That's why I brought it up, because a lot of the kids know how to do it, and it's no big deal. Yeah, to phishing change those things. is so bad these yeah. days. AI has completely changed the world mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to phishing sites. You yeah. need to know about phishing. Uh, that's, that's somebody good. sends you an email. Um, Quishing is now QR code, smishing. Those are all those text messages you get. Oh, yeah, yeah. There is a new site created every 11 seconds. It is the every 11 seconds, a new phishing site. And people are losing so much money to these every yeah. single day. Okay. AI makes it so realistic. To It's so hard to know, is that really my bank so site? Is that really right. so crazy. a site that I've downloaded? So get some extra, yeah. extra protection. Uh, just today, McAfee came out with uh, AI scam protection. Oh okay. So they're actually using AI to fight these AI cyber criminals. Okay. Jen, thank you. Yes. Expect a lot more of this. Thank, thank you, Jen. Thank you so yeah. much. Oh boy. All right, coming up, those aren't downward dogs. We're going to take you to the zoo where elephants are doing yoga. And we're going to tell you why it's so important. <laughs> then later, Jamie Lynn Siegler joins us live. We are going to catch up with her and hear about her new project with her former on screen brother. We'll be right back. with Wellness Wednesday, and we all know that yoga has benefits for our bodies and mind. But this morning, we're taking you to a different kind of class where you can see a 6,000-pound elephant doing downward dog. Ooh. NBC's Priscilla Thompson is live from the Houston Zoo with more on that. Hey, Priscilla. Hey, Priscilla. Hey guys, so yes, it is called Elephant Yoga. It is part of their daily exercise routine to help keep the herd there flexible, healthy, and mentally engaged. And I had an opportunity to serve as an elephant caretaker for the day and help get them ready for their classes. Check it out. Meet Tess, a 6,000 pound, 40 year old mom who is the zoo's breakout star, Yogi. Why is elephant yoga so important? It helps to maintain the overall health and well-being of all of the animals in our herd. What a good girl, what a good girl. Dr. Christine Moulter is the zoo's veterinarian. It gives our trainers an opportunity to have a close personal relationship with each individual animal, take a close look at them every single day to be vigilant for any concerns in their health and mobility and well-being. Before the elephants start class, we all got up close and personal with their morning routine. It's 7 a.m. at the Houston Zoo, and it's the busiest time of the day for elephant trainers and staff. All right, let's go clean the elephant mess. Who must first take care of some big business in the yard. Teamwork. It takes a lot of teamwork to take care of elephants. Before the zoo's 12 Asian elephants come out for yoga class. All right, 
go bathe some elephants. Rob Bernardi is the elephant curator, and Kristen Wendell is the elephant supervisor at the zoo. We get them nice and clean so they can go out and dust in the sand and get dirty again. Yeah, he's a little dusty up there. After a bath, the elephants all wait patiently to begin their postures. No mats here, just lots of bread, their favorite positive reinforcement treat, along with fruits and vegetables. Do the elephants enjoy it or do they just enjoy the treats? They enjoy the interaction. So we do use positive reinforcement. We use a lot of treats like apples, carrots, sweet potatoes. We also do tactile reinforcement and verbal reinforcement. Oh, mm -hmm. there it is. Yeah. Reminds me of Downward Dog. Yeah. How do you teach an elephant yoga? You start slow, and then uh, it's a lot of practice. Tess is the only elephant who can do a handstand, but practice makes perfect for all of her friends, with daily flows that include a lift, a stretch, a roll, and a bow. More importantly, Dr. Moulter says, the exercises also help trainers keep a lookout for a sign of a deadly elephant virus. Is your sense that the elephant yoga could be life-saving? I think so. Just seeing the overall responsiveness of the animal, what their attitude is like, how they're responding to those favorite treats. If they don't take that favorite treat, you know something isn't right. Finally, class ends with some bigger treats for a job well done. You have one of the most unique jobs in the world. Why do you love it? But it really is because of our interaction with these guys. Providing them optimal care and well-being is, is real special. And elephant yoga is practiced every day for up to five minutes at a time. Even the babies at the zoo start learning it from birth. This is a program that was developed by veterinarians and the staff there who helped to teach the herd upwards of 80 poses. And I know the question on everyone's mind, the oldest elephant in the herd is 54. And yes, he does still do the exercises, although he moves a little slower than the others, the younger ones. Guys, that's really cool. So there you go. Keep exercising in the old days. Today. Priscilla, are you a yogi? Do you do you practice? I am a yogi, and I hope that in my 50s, I'm still like getting oh, it like the elephants, for sure. <laughs> in your 50s, like it's like it's so far away. I hope when I'm 40 years from now. I know. Thank Priscilla, you, that Priscilla. was great. Thank yeah. you, Priscilla. All right, coming up, Soprano star Jamie Lynn Sigler is here live. We are going to find out how she's still working with her on-screen brother, and she has an important personal message to share with all of us when we come right back. became a household name when she was still in her teens. Jamie Lynn, si Jamie Lynn Sigler starred as Meadow for six seasons on the award-winning series The Sopranos. And after almost 25 years after the premiere, she's still working with her on-screen brother, Robert Eiler. They do a podcast together. It's called Not Today, Pal. Not Today. <laughs> uh, and Jamie is here this morning to tell us a little bit more about the podcast and also to share an important message as well. Always good, good to morning. have you. Thank you. So Welcome good to back. be back. Yes. Thank you. I always You're love coming. Busy these days. 
mom, wife, actress, podcaster now. Very full life. Yes, I wouldn't have it any other way. Tell us about the podcast because this, I mean, for folks who don't know, you do the podcast with your, your on-screen brother from 25 years mm -hmm. ago. And you guys still have this, like, magic. But tell folks about the podcast. Sure. Uh, yeah, Robert and I have worked together and been best friends for over 20 years. We had a very unique experience together. We know each other. We've seen each other through a lot of life. Mm -hmm. And we're also very different. Um, a lot of our podcast is him making me very uncomfortable and watching <laughs> me react to that, which is not far off from real life. And it's just a nice, it's a nice opportunity for people to see other sides of us, get to know us a little bit more. And it's just, it's just silly and fun. We're there to make people laugh and just have a brief 30 minutes of forgetting about your problems. Okay, so on that note, we found some uh, things you guys talked about that grabbed our attention. This one in particular, you said that um, you'd rather give birth than go to the dentist. That's Ooh. correct. And that you sleep at a temperature of 67 degrees yes. every night. Oh. Not by choice, but that's my husband's choice. Well, that's Craig. He likes you like it hot around here. Our okay. pool around here. Cool. Yeah, but I also live in Austin now, uh, which is we've had over 100 degree temperatures for over three mm -hmm. months, so 67 is <laughs> lovely. And you'd rather give birth than go to the dentist? I had lovely births. I don't know. I really don't enjoy the dentist. It's just everyone, I guess, has something, and that is the place the I just thing. do not want to At go least to. with birth, there's like something to help you along a little bit. At the dentist, it's you just like You get something like they at just, the end, yeah. yeah dentist, true. sometimes, you know, you're, yeah. yeah. So you don't get to go home with anything exactly. fun and cute. Uh, we, we have had a sleep expert on that said 67 degrees is the ideal temperature oh, for, well, for best boom. sleep. There we go. Um, it, it's seven years ago on the Today Show, you revealed that you suffered from RMS. Yes. And I thought it was interesting because I read that you said if someone asks you, how are you doing? Yeah. It used to be triggering for you. Mm -hmm. not, not anymore, but it used to be. Why is that? Well, I think it used to trigger me because I kept my RMS a secret. Mm. And so... I really wanted to be able to say how I was, but couldn't. And I also didn't know if I was ready. And so when you talk about being here seven years ago, I think it was a lot about me seeing how the world would accept me now that they knew that I live with multiple sclerosis. But now I'm here today yeah. where I accept me with this, which has been quite a journey of self-reflection. I think we all have things that can, you know, challenge us sure. but i think can also be a catalyst for mm -hmm. great growth mm -hmm. and so i'm so proud of where i'm at today and i've collaborated with novartis on this mm -hmm. project where we develop this three-step guide where we talk about reflecting reframing and reaching out because mm -hmm. with all of my experience and despite me being able to sit here today i am no different than anybody that's living with ms yeah. and i really feel like i have things to share and tools and things that I found that have really helped me. And so if this calls to anybody, you can go to reframingms.com for more information. Mm -hmm. But really, the reframing and understanding that you can pivot in your life and you can still do things, mm -hmm. they may not look the same or be the same. Mm -hmm. For instance, I'm a baseball mom. So I get a <laughs> wagon that I can push where I can walk the long distance. Mm -hmm. Or if I'm going out with girlfriends, they'll drop me off at a restaurant and go they find go parking. Park. Mm -hmm. You know, it, I, I still want to fully participate yeah. in my life. Mm -hmm. and. I found ways to do yeah. that. I love that. We should mention you are a paid spokesperson for that pharmaceutical yes. company, Novartis. And for folks who want to find out a little bit more about this, this three-step program to reframe the way they look at RMS, what's that. the website again? ReframingMS.com. I love Reframing that. ReframingMS.com. Thank you. I love Thank that. Thank you so much. So good to see you. We do. Wait, wait, wait. I just have one more thing. Oh. Yeah. Because I know there's somebody very special oh to you. Oh, my gosh. Your grandmother yes. is 102 years old. Oh. Whoa. Okay. And my mom, okay, oh. her name is Amelia Lopez. She lives in Manhattan all by herself. She's from Cuba. And my mom has submitted her to be a Smucker's <laughs> birthday like every year oh and she never goodness. got on. So this is so huge. Well, this is so amazing. Makes we, me want to cry. I want to spin around a Smucker's jar for her right now. Oh hey! my God. She's 102 years Yay. old. Yay. She's the best. Mima, we call her. I love you. Oh. Te quiero mucho. What a life. I love it. Mm -hmm. Thank you Wait, so take much. a picture of the jar here. We got to be <laughs> we'll, save we'll, this we'll, moment. We'll get you a picture of it. We'll get you a picture. <laughs> oh my God. My mom's going to post that on Facebook. And <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you so much. The podcast, Not Today, Pal, that podcast is out right now. Well, thank, you. thank you. All right, coming up, the fall season means new possibilities. We're looking deep into the stars in our astrology forecast. Then later, some good old-fashioned cocktails. We're sharing the bartender's secrets to a fancy drink you can make right at home. That's a bartender I trust. Third hour today. We'll be right back. Straight out of Central Cash. <laughs>
All right, this morning we are looking into the stars for a fall astrology forecast. The fall equinox promises to bring some major new beginnings. Astrologer and author Stephanie Campos is here. But before we get started, we want to remind you these are interpretations of planetary patterns, not scientific fact. Put that out there. Stephanie, thank you for coming. Welcome back. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I have the first question, number one, and it says, first up, you have some predictions for Craig and I. I oh, do. Nervous. Okay, let's start with you, Chanel. Oh, so okay. there's two dates that are coming up. There's a full moon in Aries on September 29th okay. and a solar eclipse in Libra on October 14th. Okay. And these are taking place on your financial axis. So this is a cosmically aligned time for you to ask for a raise. Oh, no. Yes. <laughs> You may be redoing your budget. Yeah. And this is somebody called Caesar. And if you're Listen. taking on new projects or contracts around this time, it's really important for you to advocate for your value, your talents, and your worth. Wait, what day is that? Where's my phone? September 29th. <laughs> September 29th. Friday. Yes. Next Friday. And October 14th. You guys remind me, tweet me. Next okay. Friday, it's a big day. All right. How about and me? If Chanel's Craig. coming into money, what about you? <laughs> well, so, I'll uh, take your money. October is Fire. going to be a She's very busy month for you. So you may be attending exciting social events. Maybe you have some travel plans. I do. Okay, it's a great time to connect with family and friends. And also sign up for a class if you want to learn something new. I don't want to learn anything new. No. Okay. But, I, but if I did, I would do it in October. Uh, yes. So I have a question because I remember the last time you were here, you said September 4th was going to be a, a big day. Mm -hmm. So I wrote it down in uh -huh. my calendar. I knew, and I I knew this wondered. was coming. <laughs> I'm just wondering, like, how hard and fast are those days? And am, am I not looking for the Listen, right thing? This girl texts me at the morning, and she's like, guys, it's my day. my day. So they're windows of time. So okay. sometimes it's leading up or mm. it can be after. But you can't predict everything with astrology. For right. example, I recently found out that I'm pregnant. Whoa. Oh, Thank you. Thank Good you. Much. And I didn't see it coming in the stars. But I do have That's a fall awesome. prediction for you. Okay. And so hopefully I can redeem myself. Okay. On November 13th, there's a new moon in Scorpio, and this is taking place on your rising sign. Mm -hmm. Now, the rising sign is all based on the moment you took your first breath, so it's a very sensitive point in the chart. Mm -hmm. This is going to be a great time for new beginnings, initiating new projects, redefining yourself, okay. and even advocating for your needs and desires in your important relationships. Okay, okay. November 13th. Yeah. Advocating has been an important thread, I feel yeah. like. Yeah. I'll also say my whole luggage drama, I'm just going to bring up more stuff. My whole luggage drama, they actually explained this to you. Yes. And there were dates where it's not surprising that this happened. It was so fascinating. I I'm a total <laughs> astrology nerd, so it was, but it was absolutely fascinating. So you lost your luggage on July 21st. Oh. Yeah. That was right Stop. when Venus, the planet of that represents clothing went retrograde. Retrogrades <laughs> bring delays, setbacks, mm -hmm. and travel mix-ups. Okay. You're a Leo. Yes. That retrograde took place in the sign of Leo, so it would have impacted you the most intensely. Mm. Then, and it did. Yes. And then there's Mars, which is this planet of frustration, and it was hitting a very sensitive I'm point. I'm on Mars chart. right now. <laughs> <laughs> and it would have meant that that day, mm. some sort of irritating or annoying personal situation would have come up in your life. Mm -hmm. Now, the day that the luggage was returned to you, the sun, which is a planet of illumination, mm -hmm. was at the same exact point Mars was at. So it was tracing over those steps, okay. and it brought clarity and resolution to your Did luggage saga. Is that not incredible? Stephanie, next time you come, you should charge Dylan. <laughs> Your hourly rate, because we're gonna, clearly we're she leave. thinks you're her personal well, astrologist. I just find that all fascinating. So October, to just to be clear, lunar eclipse and solar eclipse, which I, I gather is pretty uncommon. What, what does that mean, if anything? So eclipses, we have them every year. So that is to be expected. But they're like supercharged full moons and new moons. So they interweave our fate and our destiny. So on October 14th, we have the new moon solar eclipse in Libra. We have not had one since October of 2004, so it's been a while. So what does that mean? Well, it's a new moon, so this is a new beginning, a fresh mm. start, and Libra is the sign of relationships, so maybe a new faded relationship or connection is forming in our life around that time. And then we have a lunar eclipse on October 28th in the sign of Taurus. Oh, that's my sign. That's right. And we oh, have not interested. had one. We won't have one again until 2031. So oh, this wow. is the last lunar eclipse in Taurus for a while. Wow. And 
it will bring us back to November 8th of last year because that's the last time we had a lunar eclipse in Taurus. So similar themes or topics, whatever was going on in your life around that time may come up again. Stephanie, thank you. And congratulations. And congratulations. Thank you. That's so exciting. Thank you so much. Hey, okay. All you have to bring your, well, I'm not going to ask you. What are you doing? What are you having? I won't do all that. From, a little Aries. Oh, you oh, me that's too. Awesome. Today.com slash astrology for more. Today.com slash astrology. Up next, some colorful cocktails Yay. that look fancy, but they're so easy that you can mix them up tonight. A little, a little midweek treat. I love treat. that. You love that. When the third hour of today comes right No up. cocktails for you. No. <laughs> I'm up. Do you ever get that craving for, you know, a fancy cocktail made mm. at home? Yes. Well, we have some recipes that will liven up your hump day. Joining us is Tim Sweeney, the head bartender at Pebble Bar here in New York City. In fact, it's actually just right across right the street there. from the studio. We can mm -hmm. run over there right after this. You can get us, you know, all lubed Situated. up and we're good to go. Oh, okay. yeah. I mean, we're going to do this at 10 a.m. Let's do it. it. Let's it's got to be 7 a.m. somewhere, right? <laughs> all right. We're starting with. Your take on an old fashioned. Early's, Early's old, fashion. old fashioned. This is a classic old fashioned. When it comes to a dark, boozy whiskey cocktail, the Bellwethers really are the old fashioned and the Manhattan. I understand we have a whiskey aficionado over yes, here. Yes, we do. I, en I enjoy a bourbon. I, I enjoy a rye like, as well. We park you. our cars in the I same see. garage. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I like your garage. So, rye, this one's done with rye here. Rye is going to give it a little bit more spice, bourbon would give it a little more sweetness mm. to it. Uh, we're going to start with some Angostura bitters on that one. Ooh. That's good. Gonna, that is good. I don't like any whiskey. This orange. is really good. I say really? yes, too. I think this is what I, how I need to drink whiskey or rye or whatever. Amazing. Yes. Wait, this, you might be a first. You found something all of us like. Oh, this well, is, hopefully I go four for four, but, okay. you know, if I'm batting 250, I'm Not still bad. batting eight for the Brewers. <laughs> <laughs> so. That was really funny. You like that? I like that. Well, well, you know, I'm not so much cool enough to not be funny. <laughs> this would be your demerara syrup on here. Now, you can do it with a simple at home. I prefer it with a dark brown sugar, kind of too dark. Dark brown sugar? sugar. Uh, that was Chanel's you... nickname in high school. I <laughs> what? Well, me and Chanel, we both graduated from Big Ten schools, Go so cats. we feel it. Thank you. I went to Wisconsin. They might deny it, but I have pictures. <laughs> so... Basically, yeah. you see how my hands are shaking? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, it'd be fine that the neurons don't shoot across my brain quite as fast as I'm on national television. Oh, so that's okay. Time. All right. Trust this one's really going to be stirred. Okay. Shaking is something you do with citrus. Citrus loves that. Really? Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, it but changes the whole complexion on, the on there. Here. Well, that for the little taste. But I'm saying okay. the lemon juice, the lime juice, oh, 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 if okay. I put dairy in there. But here we're just trying to dilute it. Okay. Okay. I say, I'm yeah, not that's trying good. to change the whole this complexion of it. That's really good. That's beautiful. Mm. I don't want to run out well of time. Well done. All right, then we'll move right on this, down the road. That was delicious. Moon this unit really Zappa? Good. Moon unit Zappa. Okay. Full disclosure, we should probably point out that this hot sauce I is say, Jacob Sobroff. That one, his Jacob brother. Sobroff. That's why yeah. we put the tape. His brother, on. right? His brother, yeah. His brother. Yeah. So wait, you put a hot sauce. If they want to give me money, I'll take it. Wait, you put hot sauce in the drink? Heck yeah! This is a this is a form of a spicy margarita, really. All right, let's taste it. How do you do it? Let's go with it. So what we have here, it's like a Tommy's margarita, which is done with agave instead okay. of uh, orange liqueur, instead of triple sec. And it's going to have that spice to it. You Ooh, taste that? This is mm. good. Yeah. We're, take, we're taking your palate to dark and spicy before we get to the refreshing. It's a little bit of a reverse that course. But Wait, oh, this so far, That's two good. for two. Two for two? Yeah. That, that we all like. You'd be careful with So that. what's in this one? In this one, we have our agave. We have our lime juice, we have pineapple, and we have tequila. Pineapple. Wow. Now, you have the secret. You can do it with mezcal, too. You can switch and choose your own adventure on this like one a little, a little bit. Smokier. And then 
We have fashion. the hot sauce this on top of it. Moon Unit Zappa? Yes. Did well, you did you make this up or is this a thing? Moon Unit Zappa is the daughter of Frank Zappa. Uh, she sang on uh, the song Valley Girl. That was big back when. Okay. And she did me a favor when I met her when she was younger. She doesn't even know it. So oh, that's my thank that's you to you, so Moon nice. Unit Zappa. Okay, so this next really one cool. is called Green River. Yes, this is a Green River. River. This one is an East Side cocktail. Okay. It's very, very refreshing. Uh, it's basically, when you say a riff, like uh, the East Side would be... Uh, Nine Inch Nails version of her. This is the Johnny Cash version. Okay. And what we did okay. is we added some aloe liqueur to it. That gives it oh. real, that real refreshness. Aloe liqueur? Which is not a word, but Wisconsin English degree. Fresh. All right, go for it. Shut How up. do you do I, it? This is really good, too. Wait, what is aloe this, oh, I'm making them wrong there. For end of summer. I hate one. Dude, liqueur. you are amazing. Well, thanks. Tell the world that. The cucumber's a nice touch. Can you show really oh. quickly how to do it? We only have like 30 seconds. Absolutely. Between. Well, basically, I'm going to take cucumber juice. I'm wow. going to take lime juice. I'm going to take that Demerara from before. And we're going to take. You can do it with gin. You can do it with vodka. You can do it with tequila. If you find a cucumber gin, that's the way to do it. Wow. You can do it without the aloe liqueur. I love it with. And all these recipes, I believe, are going to be available on Today. your website. Tim, really quickly, so this, last this last one. This last one, we basically have a mix between a vodka sour and a Moscow mule known as a ubiquity. ubiquity. It's like a ginger lemonade with vodka on here. Mm. And what's how do you do one? it? Yeah. In this one, we have ginger syrup. You can store by that one. If you make it at home, it's going to be better, but still. And then you have a little bit of simple. You have lemon juice. You have vodka. And you have a look on your face like, hey, I might have done okay. No, I'm like, do you do parties? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> parties, <laughs> weddings, bar mitzvahs. I'm kidding. This These is amazing. Really all of them. And it's hard to well satisfy all of us because we're all kind of, you know, we have different flavor profiles. Well, I'm glad I could be so three dimensional. Wow. Tim, thank you. <laughs> thank you. You said three dimensional. He's funny, too. You yeah, should have like good. a show. You should have a party. Hey, it looks aren't every You're good. good. <laughs> I know it, brother. Go yeah. more. Head to today.com slash food. We'll oh, be right back. Cheers to you. Before we go, we have some very special guests here in Studio 1A, some littles who are part of the Big Brothers Big Sisters of America Mentorship Program. Big Brothers Big Sisters provides once-in-a-lifetime mentorship moments for you through one-on-one -on -one career shadowing on-site, because if you can see it, you can be it, right? That's right. I was a big back in the past, such an incredible organization, so thank you for coming by. Katie Stilo, our food stylist. Katie. She's a big. I'm a big because of you. Well, really? Give your names really quickly. Oh, we don't have time. We don't have time. Shoot. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye. Bye. Good morning, everybody. Here's what's happening in your neck of the woods. Oh, you deserve to be celebrated. Way to go, Reynolds. Oh, Al. Al, you're all of our heroes. Yeah. Y'all love Al Roker. <laughs>
Yes. It's Wednesday. It's the 20th day of September. We're so happy that you're here. Right thank in you. the middle of the week. Can we just say thank you for joining us at our little table? It's fun. With nice. our, flowers our flowers and the two of and us. And we're all together. You're having your coffee. We're having ours. And our new pink mugs. Y'all want these mugs? These I mugs. do. I do too. They're kind of a throwback. Like, I feel like my grandma Jenna had a mug that looked like this. You know what I love about this mug? Certain mugs, they have the right feel in your hand. Like, have you ever had an oversized mug that's way too big? Yeah. Or a small mug? This one sits right. You're like, oh. And I wonder how it is in the micro. Does it get too hot? Is it one of those that know. doesn't? Are you the type of person, because I am, that re-microwaves their coffee? Micro, micro, over micro. Over and over. Oh, there's five sips left. Let me just mm -hmm. put it in I know. for I'm 30. actually disappointed I didn't do it for my one sip. All right. All right, so Wheel of Fortune has been making some news. Because yeah. all of us love Vanna White love. and fans of hers um, are thrilled for her today. Yeah, so if you remember the backstory here, so it's been widely reported that Vanna White had not gotten a raise in 18 years, okay? So she's been doing this job as a staple on the show, and 18 years later, she, according to some reports, never got a raise. Yes. So it was announced yesterday that Vanna, in fact, renewed, signed the new contract, a two-year deal, mm -hmm. and this was after kind of a standoff because they probably expected her just to march right on in like yeah. you always did you're the girl who just says yes thank you yeah you know what's so interesting so she joined the show in 1982 oh my god she's and and if you say do you know who vanna white is yeah she's anywhere, like yeah. people are like we know yes, vanna we white do. yeah she's one of the probably most well-known people but i wonder had this not been reported that she you know hadn't received a raise she mm. wasn't being paid her worth would she have received I mean, a, a paycheck? I mean, who knows? Here's the thing. I think for anyone who's in a job, a new job or a good job, you feel grateful. So you want to say thank you yes. and you do that. So you say thank you, thank you. And then when the next negotiation, the next it runs out, sometimes they're like, look, it's not the right time, but we love you and... And next and time. Next time, next time, maybe it'll be time. And then you sign like another four year deal or something. Four more years because you know what? Yeah. Still the industry. The right. Yeah. But anyway, I guess the story is no matter what your job is, when do you go in and say, I would like a raise and here's why. Yeah. And why, when you just said, I would like a raise, Did, does it make me feel yeah, kind of nervous? Flip. Yeah. It's such a fine line because I feel like especially women have been taught to like be appreciative, be grateful. Be, you look what you've got. Look where you are. Yeah, say thank you. I mean, I used to think in our business, if you sat at your desk oh, yeah. and just worked really hard, that over there your boss was going to see you because I'm. it's here. It's yeah. after 7 p.m. Yeah. I'm working. I'm working. That, that That's not how it works. No. Like, no one is going to know. You have to actually go in and say. But I think what's important is when you go in to ask for a raise, you have to have more than just because I feel like I deserve oh, it. Oh, yeah, totally. You have to say, me, Vanna White, I've been on this show for X number of years. Yeah. The ratings have been X. Yes. I am a, I am a mainstay on this program. Look and what I'm I've important. done. Look what I've done. Like, show them. So it's hard work. Yeah. Plus, plus which I think this is yes. the, the hard part. Putting your neck out there a little. Yes. You know, and what if saying, you get a no? What if you get a no? The answer is no. So then what do you do? Yeah, being able to say, well, maybe there's some somewhere better for me, you know? And that's tough because, like, like with anybody, you're like, well, I need this job. Yeah. I just know I deserve more. Um, I think it's one of the hardest thing for, things for women to do because I went for many, many, many years. I know throughout my years, you know, I was making in local news and whatnot, I was definitely making a fraction of what my male co-anchors were making for sure. I actually never asked no, because, because you didn't want to be I didn't want to be, yes, yeah. I didn't want to wake up every day and go, oh my God, I'm killing myself and I'm making one quarter of what this guy's totally. making who just rolled in hot yeah. and read the prompter. Right. Yeah. So I think there is some of that, but I think it's it's asking. When I first came here, I was, I think I was the lowest paid uh, correspondent at Dateline. It was pretty clear that that's the way it was. And I remembered thinking to myself, like, I can't pay my bills here. Like, I couldn't pay all my yeah. bills at the same you're time. You're living in New York City. Yeah, so you're like, I'll pay this one and then pay that one. And then you say to yourself, well, I, you know, if your argument is, I can't pay my bills to live here, is this going to work for me? Mm -hmm. And then pretty soon after time, I ended up, you know, it, you ended up, you know, get making money. But it was a, it's a slog through. Yeah. And I think it's also how we teach our girls. Yeah. 
to, to, to both be humble because that's Im yes. important to me. Humility is important, yeah. Work hard, but then not be afraid to ask for what they right. feel like they're Right, and both, both things can be true. Yeah. You can have grace and humility and still ask for what you deserve. Yeah. Like both of those things can, can yes. happen at the same time. <sighs> I'm glad Vanna got her money. Me it's time. too. Come on, Vanna. Come on. 1982, she's been doing it. I mean, and lucky Ryan Seacrest to work with her. Yeah. Don't you think? Yes. Lucky him. Okay. Okay, Rihanna just made news, y'all, because she put out the first photos. What? Yes, the first photos of her second baby. Let's see. Can I want to see. introduce the world to Riot Rose. <gasps> oh, oh my God. Oh, that outfit. So cute. Oh, Riot. Riot. Oh my God! And Riot joins brother Riza. Now they're a family of four. Oh my God! Look at how Rihanna's looking, like glowing. Oh my God! So there's a baby and a toddler. Oh. Don't you remember those yes, days? Yes, one to two. And do you remember two to three? Two to three. What was what was two more... to three was a hard hard to remember. Was it hard? No, I think one to two is the shock. What well, what was that like when? Well. I mean, Mila was, there was not much of a gap. Yeah, yeah. What's so their age difference? Mila's only like two, two year, years. Two years, yeah. Two and a, a little bit more. Yeah. So like to have two babies, I mean, they're, they're, they're now they're pre-tweens. But anyway, to have those little girls together, mm -hmm. I mean, it's both beautiful. Do you remember when I FaceTimed you when you brought your home Yes, home? yes, I do. Yes, What I were do. those couple weeks like? That was, you know what? Because you're so into the baby, obviously, you hope you had to just make sure everything was right. And you almost forget. But I was looking back, it's funny, at old pictures. And Hope was in the bassinet and Haley was sleeping under the bassinet. Oh. It's like all those things. But you realize, well, you also realize how much you hovered over your first Oh, one. I know. It's like, we why did we them. do that? We ruined them. <laughs> sorry to all the firstborn we kids. We ruined y'all. Well, I because mean, we were like hovering every time they yeah. called. What is it? Like, and now, now it's we're. It's because it was our nervousness. We didn't know. No, no. We placed all of our, our anxiety oh. in your bassinet oh, God. with your binky. Yes. You want a little anxiety? <laughs> <laughs> want us to wake you up all night long because we want to make sure you're breathing? <laughs> <laughs> That's why, yeah, I mean, that's why. Remember every fever? We were like oh, yeah. running to the pediatrician. Oh, yeah. My pediatrician, I called her, she was like, she's it's fine. fine. Like, no, I, I, I mean, it was to a but, point and where you, you, you. And you were, and I remember sitting on the New York City streets next to the rats because Mila had some sort of RSV or something. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and, and it, she was sick. Yeah. But I was like, what do I do? Yeah, we didn't you know. Didn't know. Uh, you know, we didn't know. We had to get cabs to take oh, our kids. No. Anyway, anyway, sorry to all the firstborns. Yeah. All right. I we love a good movie musical, and this one is in our can't wait for that category. Oh my gosh, we cannot wait because over the weekend, a new trailer dropped for the upcoming Oprah produced movie, The Color Purple. Take a look. Today, I teach you taught us about a place called Africa. Our mamas come from Queens over there. You know what that means? We royalty. That's a lot of women. You seem like trouble. Now, I come here out of respect. But if there ain't nothing to get, that show ain't nothing to get. Hey! go to Raji P. Henson's in it. Who else is it? Fantasia. Danielle Brooks. Oh my God. John Baptiste. John Baptiste. And her. her. And so many more. Oh my God. Y'all, it's, it's Alice Walker's famous book, of course, but it's based on the Broadway musical. It's an adaptation of that. I cannot wait. Music to plus see the, Alice Walker plus Oprah plus all those Fantasia actors. Fantasia singing it out. Okay. Can and we, oh, it doesn't open until Christmas Day. What a Christmas <laughs> present. That's what you're waiting for. Okay. Yeah, there you go. Okay, we can wait. Mm -hmm. um, okay, coming up next, y'all, would you get offended if your friend put a filter on a photo of you? We're going to hash it out in Girl Code coming up right after this. What do you mean, put a filter on? <laughs> what does that mean? But also, why is she taking a solo shot?
It's time to help out our viewers one friendship at a time mm -hmm. in a segment we like to call Girl, Girl Code. Code. All right. Okay, here's the first one. Ready? Okay. My girlfriend just finished cosmetology school and asked me if she could cut my hair. I love my friend, but I also love my hair <laughs> and would prefer she get some more experience under her belt. Can I tell her no? Hmm. The only reason why this one is a hard one is it's like I kind of feel like you want your friends to feel like they've confident. got it. Yeah, confident. And I think if you said, can you get more experience, it, it's hard for her not to feel like she's not, she hasn't done what she needs to do. Yeah, you know? I mean, I think the fact that her friend feels com confident enough coming out of cosmetology school to, to say, ask her. can I cut your hair? Like, if I just went to cosmetology <laughs> school and I said, hey, Jenna, I'm, I just graduated, can I cut? Would you, what would you say? Well, I don't, I don't care about my hair as yeah. much as others. Yeah. I mean, I haven't gotten it. I need a haircut. So if you cared about it, you wouldn't. Yeah, but also, here's what I would do. What? Just say, I want very little off. <laughs> I want just a tiny dusting. That's the word they dusting. call it. Dusting. Dusting. A trim. Just take off my split the ends. ends. And then, if she messes up, you can go get a so normal what? cut. I know. Yeah, I think if you're good enough friends, if you say, look, honey, I love you, but you just got out of school. It's like, you know, someone who yeah. just got his driver's license is going to drive an 18-wheeler down the highway. It's like it's not happening. Okay. Okay. All right, next one. Views. Here we go. I asked a friend to send me a photo we took together so I could post it. She sent it back with our faces heavily filtered. Am I right to be offended? A lot of people filter pictures. Yeah. A lot of people do and that. And it's not like I she, it's, it's not just like a solo shot of you. Right. She didn't just, or she didn't just filter you and leave herself no, alone. No, no. She filtered both of y'all because, listen, the girl wants to be filtered. She wanted to throw a nice filter on there. And it isn't about you. It's about her. Because she let's wants be to honest, post it. when people look at a photo, Who do they, they look, look to make sure that no, everybody looks no. good? No. They look for number one. What? You, one of us could have our eye roll back in our head and be like, that's so cute. Look. Totally. You're like, no, you look cute. Totally. I look like I'm on drugs. Yeah. And you know what? I actually feel like we need to take care. I think this is a bigger question. What? Let's take care of our friends. When we look at pictures, let's look at everybody in the photo. Yeah. Right. Let's look at the positioning of our arms. Yeah. Let's make sure. Well, you don't of, care about the positioning of your well, arms. Well, you know, just you do here's not. the thing. If don't this is talk your, about look, FOMO, look, now, whatever. Now, pretend. Fat on no mo. Stop. Fat on no mo. Nobody it's a non-for-profit I started. That. You don't. Care Fat on no mo? You are you are so Fat full. Om no mo. It's a very important nonprofit. It is called Take Care of Your Girl. Now, if we're taking a picture photo, Nate, will you take our photo? Okay. Now pretend we're taking this picture and I put you in front of me. Yeah. And I'm behind yeah. and I'm just worried about me. Now, in the Fat Om No Mo non for profit I've created, <laughs> you squeeze in, you give your girl a little Fat Om No Mo. What does that mean? You're taking away half my arm? Yeah. Oh, okay. look. And hold her waist. <laughs> oh, God. I don't care. You don't care. You don't really care. I'm just really saying, care. I want to take care of my people. No, I do out think there. I do think we need everyone to look good. But yeah. you know you couldn't care less about how you are. I just want to take care, care of my girl. But I do think Thank you're you. right. <laughs> girl code. <laughs> All right, Thank here's the last Nate. one. My photo friend Nate knows that I have something called the pregnancy test. That means that when he takes pictures of any of us, if we look pregnant, go ahead and X them out of an oh, computer. Okay, all right. All right. Okay. okay. Here we go. go. My friend and I were recently chatting on what I thought was a private phone call, but her husband chimed in on the conversation. <laughs> what? We were on speaker and she didn't oh. let me know. Am I right to be upset? Yes. Yes. But also, yes, I thought right. she meant that the husband was like on th th no. three way, like olden days, no, you know? No, no, It's like, Speaker. so, anyway, sweetie, blah, blah, blah. I don't think so. From yeah. across the room? No. You no. got, I think you uh -uh. have to very clearly state, hi, honey, you're on speaker. Yeah. Because you might say something. Ever things. done that in the car? Oh, yeah. Someone calls you, oh, yeah. and you're with your kids in the oh, car, yes. and you know that they're the foul mouth friend, you know? <laughs> you're like, speaker! <laughs> Hey, girl. Am I yeah. the foul mouth friend? Sometimes. Everyone. But, <laughs> all right, if you've got a girl code question, send it to us. HodaandJenna.com. Hit the connect button. Coming up next, actress Nicole Ari Parker. Find out how she managed to pull off an epic surprise for her family right after this. <laughs> oh, my God, we're in but Right? I don't know. It's a
Mari Parker is an actress, businesswoman, and mom who knows how to slay the red yeah. carpet. <laughs> and pretty soon she'll be killing it on stage as well. Yeah, Nicole's heading back to her first love, and that is, of course, the theater. It's a show right here in New York City. It's called The Refuge Plays. Hi! Hi. I'm so, <laughs> so happy just to see you. Wow, well, I'm so happy to be well, here. Well, we want to get to this, this yeah. show, which I think sounds amazing, but can we just first talk about where you are in your life? You just dropped your daughter off at college. I did, oh my, my Sophie. I blinked. She was just... How does that feel to be in that moment? Oh. Well... Oh, oh, my God! Did you see that? That yes. was their first day of school. And now and she's she, a I know. freshman. And you know, it really oh. hit her brother pretty hard too because yeah. she's been the bossy big sister <laughs> his whole life. Oh my God. And now no one's yelling at him, no one's punching him in the arm. No so one's... do you leave her room as it is? You yeah. Can... Yes. Yeah. She's gonna, she's gonna home come home. Lot. She's gonna come I home. I know. And did y'all yeah. go to Beyonce the night before? Are you the best mom Who ever? Who are you? How would you do that? <laughs> I don't know. Boris hooked that up. It was we and I we managed to surprise them. And my kids are really smart. Like Wait, so they can you sniff were things they out. They can say, sniff things and, out. And not only were you at Beyonce, you were with Tina Knowles. Yeah. That's yes. Her mother. Yes. <laughs> Amazing. It was a pretty epic night. Oh we told them we were going to like a uh, a cocktail party for the Chamber of Commerce. Oh, God. Wow, so and they it, were totally bored? The opposite. They <laughs> and they were like, go. really? Do we have to go? I said, like, yeah, you kind of have to go. So, and as we got closer, they realized where we were because you could hear the... How, by the way, how was the concert? Yeah. It was spectacular. Was it? Yeah. Everything. Everything. And to be there with them bef the night before I drop her off at college. Yeah. It was, it was what was she like in college, by the way? So She's far. having a blast. She's enjoying it. And so far, all A's. Look at High that. Wait, yes. girl. <laughs> Did she call home? She does. Yeah. I get text messages mm -hmm. every now and then. Mm -hmm. um, and, and now that I'm in New York and she's at Howard in DC, so she, she's oh, just a yeah. right there. Yeah. Okay, we have to talk about this play yes. because it is remarkable. You play the same woman mm -hmm. in three decades, mm -hmm. three of different parts of her, her life. life. Yeah. Um, she's 18 and one, about 45, 50 in the middle, and um, and 80. What was as the well. easiest for you to play? What did you feel like you fit in? They're all, uh, this character has been through so much, they're all kind of yeah. uh, difficult to um, really get in there, but it's, it, I'm having the best time. I'm having the time of my life. I'm up for the challenge. Yeah, I mean, it's a major challenge. Yeah. Because yeah. you're, it's you, you know? Yeah. And I wonder when you, when you have the makeup on for playing the 80 year old, mm -hmm. Is that a surreal experience to sort of see mm -hmm. yourself? Yes, it is. And, um, but I feel so beautiful. I mean, you know, we're all trained oh, to be so afraid of yeah. aging. Yeah. This character is really mighty. So I, I just love all parts of her. How do you feel about aging? It's an interesting thing, especially in yeah. Hollywood or on stage, wherever. I mean, it's a thing that we all run into and we notice things, but how has it been to you and what do you think when you, how do you imagine yourself at 60, 70, 80? How do you see yourself? I am so active and my husband and I love mm -hmm. to travel and, and he's so fit. Like I gotta kind of keep up in the <laughs> fitness department, but I'm having, you know, the best time of my life as a grown up. Yeah. I mean, it's getting better. And you know, I, I really think like this gr the group effort, you could say, around women's self esteem has mm -hmm. been really great. My daughter's growing up in a time of self love and, yeah. you know, uh, spiritual work and, mm. and um, acceptance and, mm -hmm. you know, acknowledging the way other people want to live their lives. Mm -hmm. Like, well, well, there's a lot of crazy stuff going on in the world too, but yeah. I feel like, you know, self esteem has been. I think it's a good in a good place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like we talk about uh, self worth in a way that probably yes. when we were growing up and body up, positivity, yeah. yes. you know, we're speaking out loud the things we're we speaking thought. out yeah. loud. So I feel really good right now. And sort of the things we were afraid of. Yes, you yeah. know what I mean. The I like my smile lines. Yes. <laughs> okay. I have a lot to smile about. Yes. You do. You just mentioned your husband. You yes. have been together what, almost twenty years. Is that right? Wow. Yeah. We've been married eighteen together for. I Over. met him in 2000. 2000? Yes. Wow. So, and what? So 23 years. 23 That's years. crazy. Isn't that funny to say it out loud? I know. Your face was like, <laughs> could that be right? Is that possible? Is that possible? What's the secret? Oh my gosh. Uh, I mean, I don't know if there's a secret. Because yeah. we're, you know, 
We're just like everybody else. Yeah, totally. Like he does, I, if I, he, if he goes to the store for me, he never comes back with the right yeah. juice. <laughs> you know, well, that but. That makes me feel so much better. Yes, it's like husband land. It's like yeah. a club. They, they, it's all the same. <laughs> and you know, but a long time you grow with them. Yeah, and you, you have different, I mean, we're now going to be back together in a way is like mm -hmm. not just parents. My son has another year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's six six though. He's six six. He's Your taller. Son is six, six. Yeah, and he's sixteen. Wow. And he's he's taller than his dad. But we're about to have another chapter. Yeah. yeah. You know, of of lots of date nights. Yeah. You know and totally. Very cool. Yeah, but Empty yeah, nesting. I'm excited. Well, yeah. We think people should go on a date night to your show. The Refuge Plays is in previews right now. It opens October 4th. Coming up next, Donna catches up with the TikTok sensation who has 6 million followers watching her get ready. Find out why after this. <laughs> With our series up next, and a 22 year old who's been called TikTok's It Girl. She is taking social media by storm. And Donna, you caught up with her. Sure You've been did. waiting for this one. I know, I'm excited for this because Alex Earl is leading the way in the Get Ready With Me trend. That's where content creators share their daily beauty and fashion routines. She's turned it all into a profitable business, and it's fair to say her millions of followers can't get enough. Well, now she is taking her online fame to the next level, and I sat down with Alex for her first ever TV interview. Check it out. This is Alex Earl, and yes, she has been on my interview bucket list since I watched, along with the rest of social media, her rise to fame. Alex Earl's combined following of more than 8.5 million across TikTok and Instagram are drawn to her intimate posts about her beauty and fashion routines. This is where I share my life with you guys. So nice to meet you. And this is her first broadcast interview. It's official. Me and my mom used to always watch the Today Show, oh. so I, I mean, it's a full circle moment. It feels surreal. The New Jersey native attended the University of Miami. Along the way, she became the face of the viral trend, Get Ready With Me. Get ready with us to go to the fair. Get ready with me to go to dinner in Miami with my friends. You sort of rose to fame with the Get Ready With Me videos. Yes. So I was thinking we could get a little bit raw and unfiltered mm -hmm. and continue the combo while we un-get ready. Let's do it. In the video that you posted about showing your acne, that was really what drew a lot of attention. Were you nervous to do that at first? I was so nervous. I did not want to post it. I got to a point where I said, this just isn't real. This isn't, it isn't authentic for me to be putting on these filters and caking on makeup and mm -hmm. pretending like I'm not struggling with something that a lot of people deal with. So I decided to post it one day and I was refreshing the post over and over because I thought, people from my school would judge me and immediately it was just this overwhelmingly kind community and I think a lot of people resonated with that. So I got my breast augmentation one year ago today. You've been open about your breast implants. What made you want to do that? People are going to know, mm -hmm. so why lie? I grew up looking mm -hmm. at these girls with these perfect bodies and, or so you think, and you think mm -hmm. that's natural and you think you're supposed to look that way, but 
That's not always real. But even as her popularity grew, the marketing major didn't skip a beat in school. Fans watched on the edge of their seats as she crammed for exams and wrote papers. I drove to campus for class. I had a final presentation this morning. The young woman who started college as a typical teenager graduated this spring as a celebrity and a multimillionaire. She has already created a scholarship in her name at her alma mater. You just signed onto Alex Cooper's Unwell Network. Yes. What can you tell us about that? Well, I am starting a podcast through this Unwell Network, so and excited. I am very, very excited about it. One topic fans are interested in, Alex's dating life. This summer, she spent time with Dolphins player Braxton Berrios. There has been some drama online surrounding who you're dating, and is there anything you want to clarify? So, that is actually what my whole first episode of the podcast oh, is so about. I'm spot on. Cotton pad me, please. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. Can you give me a hint about your relationship status? <laughs> I'm single, technically. Okay. And the rest, you're gonna have to listen. Okay. What's your advice to the millions of people who look up to you? I think to believe in yourself. Something that really helps me is setting goals. I have a journal and probably once a month I try to write down goals I have for myself and I think you come a lot further than you realize. Typically with an unget ready with me, that's sort of when you bear it all, which is what we're doing right now. But instead of it being a 30 second TikTok, it's the national TV debut. Yeah. <laughs> if you had told me a year ago that I was gonna come on the Today Show and take off my makeup, I would have been like, um, no, that's the one time that I need to have the most makeup on, but it makes me so happy that I built this brand where I'm okay with being myself and, you know, showing who I really am and showing my real skin. And you know, she is smart. She's mm -hmm. business savvy. She told me that she posts three to four times a day. Mm -hmm. um, and at first I thought this was sort of a true overnight success story, mm -hmm. but she actually told me, and in some cases it is, but she told me that she had been posting for three years prior to really getting any following. Traction. And then it was the transparency that really ignited that. Um, and I think too, you know, she told me that she knows this could get stripped away as easily or as quickly as it was built up. And I think just knowing that is so important. And so she is surrounding herself with great people and she's doing great projects, including her new podcast, Hot Mess, which premieres tomorrow. Awesome. Yeah, and I, yeah, and I, I love that she gave back to her college and she got yeah. a scholarship there. So mm -hmm. for a bunch of other she's, kids, very she's cool. Doing great awesome. stuff. Okay. Thank you, thank Thanks. you, Donna. Coming up next, Siri Daily whips up some easy after school snacks for your hungry kids mm -hmm. right after this. Today Food is sponsored by Jif. That Jif and good, I wish I was eating it right now. All right, with kids back in school, you're going to need some healthy afternoon snacks to help them power through because they got to do their homework. No, they have to do their homework, and there is no one better 
than busy mom of four and seriously delicious author Siri Daly. With the help of our sponsor, Jif, she put together some yummy after school treats and y'all can follow along by scanning that QR code. Right there. Wherever. wherever. Oh, by me, <laughs> by me, by me, right hidden. here. And you can make these recipes. Okay, Siri, hi. Hello. Yes, back to school, homework. I mean, we were just talking. My son is in high school now. How is so, that like, possible? the homework game has just, you know, up. gone up to here. But I think the problem with snacks are you eat a snack and then you're exhausted after. You need something that keeps that, your energy yes. up. Yes, so this one is my favorite for okay. that because okay. apples, I, I've actually once heard that apples give you more energy than, co than coffee. I don't oh. know if that's true, but these are well, really, I really wonderful. loves an apple. She wonderful. eats an apple a day. An apple yeah, day. my, yeah, my kids. Nice. love apple and peanut butter. So these are like a fun little way to have apples and peanut butter. You make a little sandwich. So you're going to core out your apple. I mm -hmm. like using, you know, Granny Smith, but you can use any like, apple. And then wait, when you, yeah, they're yeah. so good with peanut butter, that tart and creamy. Is it weird for me to ask how you make the circle so perfect? Well, I like using an apple core. Oh, there's a machine um, for There that. is a machine. Mm -hmm. um, I, I suggest, yeah, it's it's much easier than, okay. you know, using a knife and trying to do it okay. yourself. But um, okay, so then, you just paint this with yep, peanut butter? And then oh I like granola. to use a little granola for Texture. Mm -hmm. um, of course, my kids like chocolate chips. Oh, yeah, I'm like, yeah. Oh, why not? They're having something healthy here. Right. So, mm -hmm. but these are golden raisins. If if your kids like raisins, mm -hmm. um, and then you just make a little sandwich. That's such a cute, and that's easy cute idea. You can easily easy have them ready peasy. for when they get home, and it's just really yummy. I eat them too. Yummy. Um, yeah. Love so that's one snack. Okay. okay now another really here. really great peanut butter snack are okay. these frozen banana bites. So banana. you're gonna Yum. take a I'm banana. Yes. Um, you're gonna just slice them into little rounds, and then you're gonna make. You can make so a sandwich you, if you want. Did you freeze these first? Not yet. No, okay. these are regular. regular. And then you make little sandwiches, but then you're gonna freeze them for about an hour until okay, right they get there. firm before you dip them in chocolate. Okay. So over here, we have chocolate that is melted with a tiny little bit of coconut oil. Oh, which oh will, do you need the oil? You don't need it, but what will what that will do is it will harden the chocolate quicker and it mm. also just makes it like nice and shiny Creamy like and this. Shiny, mm -hmm. yeah. So should we dip some? Yes. Oh and then, I know, they're so good. They, you, you can dip it all the way or halfway, whatever you want. And then do you dip it um, in something else? And then, else? you know, just to make it fun, you can add sprinkles, you can add graham crackers, chopped peanuts, whatever you want, and then store them in the freezer and they'll, you know, they'll last for like a week These or two. These are delicious. Yeah, they're so yummy. Um, and the, again, just a great, I like, love that. Um, and you know what? They're delicious with or without the chocolate. Yeah, you don't need the oh, chocolate. Really? I just or you can do the white chocolate. Like some that. of this. Yeah. Okay, I'm in. I love peanut butter and banana too. I mean, Me too. Right. I'm yeah. really happy with that. Okay, and our <laughs> third snack. Um, my daughter Etta loves nachos, but I try so to get I. her to do like some protein with the nachos mm -hmm. because all she does is eat you know, carbs yeah. and cheese all day long. Me too. So this is a little um, tortilla that I've made into a round with like a cookie cutter, like oh. a three inch cookie mm. cutter. Okay. And then we're gonna put it in these muffin tins that are lightly greased. Look and you just Look at the make shape a little it makes. shape, like mm -hmm. a little flower. Look at those. Isn't that cute? So you're gonna They're bake so it first. Pretty. They're cute. So they get like this. Okay. And then this is a great thing to do with like leftover chicken or mm -hmm. leftover pork or steak, whatever you have in your freezer. Oh my gosh, I have chocolate all over my hands. That's okay. lovely. Um, mix it up with some barbecue sauce, mm. then put it in your cups okay. and of course add cheese and Can then you you'll use like taco bake seasoning it. too yeah instead totally of totally mm -hmm. um and if you don't you know you don't need to use the meat you can just add a bunch of different veggies but add the cheese bake it until it melts and gets all nice and ooey yeah. gooey over here add toppings if you want so i would eat a, yeah aren't they these so are cute? so cute this i feel like this could cutest. also be a meal yeah and this could be great like even if you had a party when you yeah wouldn't you totally. like, it's a great like sunday football yes. yeah i know you might need to bring this up to your sunday football rotation uh, maybe. are maybe. y'all still making um pizzas every sunday <sighs> yeah we try to yeah they have a pizza, pizza sunday, sunday. Carson Daly is a. I'm into it. Carson's the one. I'm into it. <laughs> All right, to get these snack recipes, head to today.com slash food. Okay, coming up next. Y'all, it's National oh Queso Day. Oh my God. Why I am sorry. I didn't realize it I was a steam holiday. Why aren't we pouring queso on I, I don't know, but I, I can't believe I'm even here. I should be at home we, celebrating no, you know why you're here. This, you know why you're here? Why am I here? Because we have a challenge. Oh. We have a queso dip challenge to find which is the Hoda and I are going to go ahead. Are you going to make your recipe? I your am. Velveeta. Famous <laughs> recipe. Okay, we'll be back right after this. Velveeta. <laughs>
love the holidays around here, and today is a big one. It is <laughs> National <laughs> okay. Queso Day. Let's go. So, Hoda, as you're very aware, from time to time, um, we have been known to put our culinary skills to the test. Uh huh. But this may be not friendly because mm -hmm. my reputation and my queso recipe, one that is gourmet, is on the line. Really? Is that right? Well, it's our first ever Hoda and, and Jenna's queso. <laughs> All right, our culinary producer, Katie Stilo, is here to help us out. So, Katie, how's this going to work? So, we both, you've both chosen your own recipes. Uh -huh. Jenna's going a little rogue. We're not doing the traditional Jenna queso recipe, so our judge may be a little bit surprised. Brian You're is both... not going to be good, hers. <laughs> Brian! 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 <laughs> Brian, I'm Brian. from Texas. Brian, no, don't I try am to making something no, specifically for you. You're about to be Brian. disqualified. Specifically for you. All right, we'll see. We'll see. You've both chosen different bases. Let's explain what ingredients you got going on before we get into this. Okay. Okay. Oda, what's what's going on? Over I've there? got cheese. What kind of cheese? Velveeta. <laughs> and then I've got I hope tomatoes. Oh, my recipe. I, I've got tomatoes, jalapenos. I don't want to give away my secret ingredient right here. Is that turmeric? No. no, it's not turmeric. But once Brian tasted, he'll know. <laughs> and these chips, Brian, are homemade. Ooh. Ooh. Homemade chips. You're welcome. Um, All right, what do you have? Uh, would you beans? like to hear from the winner? Mm. I am making a white queso, oh. uh, which is Monterey Jack cheese. Uh -huh. It has some jalapeno, some green mm -hmm. chilies. And then I am making a famous Texas dip. It is called the Bar Bob Armstrong dip. It has ground. What do you mean dip? Is it going in your queso? Oh, yeah, baby girl. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Okay, okay. Okay. I think we should start to get let's to building so we can get the tasting. We're going to okay, put 45 seconds on 45 the clock. 45 seconds. And we're going to make our queso. I don't think you even have time to mix all those. <laughs> okay. Yes, Are we ready? Yeah. Yes. All right. Three, two, one. Okay. Oh, wait, hold on. This is first. first That's first, too bad, first, Jenna. It doesn't look like it's first. going well. Oh, yeah, it's all going so in. So sad. Yeah, okay. okay. What do you think? Well, let's save a little for topping or something. Oh, now you're trying to help her. No, no. I told you to save a little bit. Oh, yeah. That's true. Yeah, save a little for what do you mean? Well, it's like a garnish. It's got to look no, pretty. Girl, I've you got... eat with your eyes. No, you think Brian cares time? about the 20... way it looks? Do you know yeah. where I'm at? Oh, yeah. We, I do, yeah. Brian you is just a connoisseur. Wants it to be good. Am I wrong, Brian? That's looking thick. <laughs> what do you mean? You all made them cheese. <laughs> this is not my department. <laughs> Hold on. You got to plate it in the final casserole. Um, you don't oh, have wait, that. What? Yeah. Yeah. Seconds, girl. yeah. Shoot. Oh, God. Oh. Jenna, sorry. Does... Oh, my God. No, it's not about oh, how my God. I fell. That's not fair. God. Okay, Brian. Thank God it's not about looks. Brian, come. <laughs> it's not mean? Brian. Okay, there's a no, river of refried beans over here. It shouldn't be about looks for you either. Kate. Well, obviously, Brian. First of all, hi. I'm so happy Hello. you're here. Me too. Okay, so I'm gonna. It's get coming. You. They're right here. This is a homemade chip. Thank you. Okay, get ready. Mm. Oh, you see that chip? You that crunch? Mm -hmm. Wait, hold on. No, no, don't go. You gotta wash behind. it down with a beer. Let's wash it down with some beer. <laughs> hold on. Okay, hold on. I think you're you're identifying that special ingredient. Yeah. No, oh, well, okay. I can drink this one. Mm -hmm, sure. You gotta clear the palate, and you know you can just get through whatever the next one is. Uh, Thank you very much. Okay. All right. Next. Brian, welcome to my table. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, this is a Barb Armstrong dip, as I told you. And I hope you're not uh, you're not allergic to ground beef, the finest ground beef, are you? No, not. Really okay, not at guacamole. All. Yeah. I'd like to introduce you to the best Apparently chips. we're getting a hard wrap. Julio's, Julio's, right out of uh, Austin, mm -hmm. Texas. Get a little of everything. Mm -hmm. And I've got a margarita so that we can share oh. my victory. Oh, we already, she's confident. Mm. I know. Here you go, Brian. <laughs> I heard him okay. say. Mm. I guess with drum really, please. Uh oh, Brian, who's the winner? Who's the, the winner? You're putting the pressure on me, hold up, but right. uh, Jenna, you, uh, <laughs> you have to win. <laughs> To be cocky, Wait, but try. I got you a mark. Let me try. Let me try. Let me taste that. Oh, I love queso. I have it. Hold on. Let me try yours. I think the ginger in Hoda's was the was maybe the kicker. Ginger. Yeah, she put ginger in hers. I'm, I don't know what that is, but that ain't queso, girl. That's cheese dip. That is real good, though. You like Brian, mine? we love you. I love you. yours. Oh, thank you. Brian, we love you. <laughs> Jen, I think you might have been right. Okay, we'll be back right after this. Mm. I was right. I need to try it with the ginger. I'm.
the homemade chip was still the way to go, don't you think? Mm. Catherine Heigl will be with us. She's an Emmy winner. <laughs> oh, yeah, and guess what? We're going to eat some more. We're going to whip up some tasty tailgate treats. You kind of like mine. My queso. Well, it had um, ginger in it, so I felt like I was having Plus, both a medicine ball and We'll some be queso. weighing in on what the has the internet divided. Get in on the debate. Head oh, to state.com slash poll. Okay. Yo, it's Wednesday. Bye. It's Bye. National Case. Welcome to today. So happy to see you guys. Would you like my boost? Yes. Get back. Here we go. Boom. Sometimes we just do things to help. That's our Hoda. Happy birthday. We got an awesome crowd, y'all. Ah, the avocado. From toast topping to sweet treats, even mac and cheese, this tasty green fruit is pretty much everywhere. But did you know the most popular variety, the Haas avocado, was developed right here in Southern California. So I came all the way across the country to find out how farmers and restaurant owners are making sure we're enjoying these for years to come. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. We call this right here the avocado tunnel of love. <laughs> In the past 20 years, believe it or not, avocado consumption has tripled in the United States. Today, the average American eats eight pounds of these babies every year. I'm at Rancho Vasquez, one of the oldest avocado orchards in the country. Here, the Vasquez family grows several different varieties. Let's avocado check it out. Oh, welcome to Rancho Vasquez. Art? Yes, Nice Art. to meet you. How's it going, sir? Damien Vasquez. Damien, nice welcome to see to the you range. guys. Army veteran Art Vasquez has turned his love for avocados into a true family obsession. Four generations live together on this scenic ranch. Many of them work in the orchard and help run the business. I've never been to an avocado farm. Wow. So, this will be gonna, a lot of fun. You guys going to give me a tour? Absolutely. All right, let's go. Art's grandfather, Refugio Morones, moved to the U.S. from Mexico in the 1920s. He picked avocados and citrus fruit on several farms, but always dreamed of having his own orchard. When Art was seven, the family purchasing their first acre of this ranch. And that's when my grandfather, Refugio, would start teaching me how to take care of the trees. That's when I, I really started loving picking. My brother and I would pick the avocados, take the avocados down to the town, knocking on doors, selling the avocados. Art put his passion for produce on hold to pursue a career in the auto parts industry. In 2002, he was able to buy the entire property, which was destined to be raised for new houses. We've taken it from 250 trees all the way up to 3,750 trees. This is something, a sustainable legacy that I can leave here and teach my children, grandkids, and the family how to work the earth how to grow things organically. Art had also saved a piece of Golden State history. Avocados are native to Mexico, but some of the first avocado trees in the U.S. were planted in L.A. County in the mid-1800s. Henry Dalton, a wealthy trader who owned ranches in California, fell in love with the fruit during trips to Central America. In 1848, Henry planted the first avocado tree in Azusa. So when he moved to Los Angeles and he took over and bought Rancho Azusa, he knew there was fresh water coming from the Azusa Canyon. And so because of having the fresh water source and the awesome soil, he knew avocados would be great here. During a tour of the ranch, I got to see a living part of that history. What makes it special is one of the first planted avocado trees in the Western United States. 
This puppy is one of a kind. It's like us, Al. It's one of a kind, <laughs> okay. And it's still producing fruit? Still producing fruit. It produces anywhere between 500 to six, 700 pounds of fruit a year. Experts estimate this tree is more than 100 years old. It produces a type of avocado known as the fuerte, in Spanish meaning strong. It was the first avocado variety to thrive in the United States because it can withstand cooler temperatures. But in the 1920s, a new variety emerged in SoCal that would ultimately dominate the world market. A guy by the name of Rudolf Haas, he was actually a postal carrier, but his hobby was growing. So he had an orchard at his house about 20 miles from here, La Habra Heights. The Haas avocado was a total accident. An amateur farmer, Rudolph had purchased some mystery avocado seeds. When the tree matured, he was surprised by the dark, bumpy fruit it produced. And that really took off commercially because it has a thicker skin. So for shipping purposes, and it's an amazing tasting fruit. The Fuerte and many other avocados stay green when mature, but the skin on a Hass turns black when ripe, hiding any bruises. It didn't take off right away among consumers in the U.S. So it took a few marketing campaigns for Americans to embrace this creamy variety of the fruit. This fourth, put a little green in your red, white, and blue. Today, 80% of avocados grown worldwide are Haas. Now here, this is one of the first Haas trees commercially ever planted. We've got two Haas trees right here. Until the 90s, the majority of avocados consumed in the country were grown in California and weren't available year round. But all that changed in 1994. President Clinton made NAFTA the law today, linking the United States to Canada and Mexico in one large trading bloc. When NAFTA passed, avocados from Mexico became available everywhere, and folks could enjoy them anytime. Today, even named avocado toast a top trend of the 2010s. Avocado toast. I'm not sure how this happened, but there came a time in the past 10 years when people began to realize that their lives were not complete without it. Thanks to clever campaigns, new diet trends, and an abundant supply, avocado consumption has boomed in the last two decades, growing into a multi-billion dollar industry. Now, 90% of those avocados come from Mexico. However, this has led to major environmental impacts like deforestation. Rancho Vasquez wants to combat the negative effects of monoculture farming. As an organic orchard, they follow strict guidelines to help protect the land. How have the trees and what you grow tried to lessen the impact on the environment? We pick the weeds by hand, or we weedy, because it's all organic. Yeah. So we don't ever spray any weed killer or anything like that. The deer come and eat all the lower leaves and skirt the trees for us, ah. and they turn that into natural manure. Now, when it comes to picking, avocados require a gentle touch. So we still do it the same high-tech way they did it 100 years ago. Wow. And this is my grandfather's pole? pole right here. Really? Yeah, this is one of the old school ones. So you can pick any of these you want. Okay. So yeah, you just slide it right up till the avocado goes in the basket, and then you pull on the rope. There you go, you're almost there. Pretty difficult, you're doing pretty darn yeah. good, you know? A little bit further, and then pull the rope. There you there go, you is. got it. Good job. <laughs> He's ready to catch. Ta-da! <laughs> there you go. My That's first a nice avocado. One too. It's going to take a week to a week and a half right now to ripen and let it get soft. How about going and tasting some? Yes, sir. We picked some about a week or so, so they'd be perfect for you. All right, let's do it.
Believe it or not, there are more than 400 varieties of avocados. Rancho Vasquez in Azusa, California, sells six. The Fuerte, Hass, Lamb Hass, Reed, Pinkerton, and Gem. Each has a different shape, taste, and growing season. I've never seen such a, like, a round avocado. The ranch's avocados are prized by chefs and customers for their high oil content. That comes from the area's climate, nutrient-rich mountain soil, and secret farming techniques that have been passed down for generations. The higher the oil content, the better the tasting fruit is. And then the longer it'll stay green. You can taste and see the difference with their organic hash. It just keeps it really fresh. Oh, you can literally fresh. see the oil coming out of it. Yeah. So if you want to try just a little chunk, we'll give you a little chunk. Oh, that's great. Next up, the family favorite, Fuerte. Oh, a real, really a different flavor. Absolutely, absolutely. There's almost, it's almost like a saltiness and a creaminess in there. Aside from his wife's guac, Art's favorite way to eat avos is actually with honey. Ooh. It's called avocado dulce, which is avocado candy. Oh my gosh. Oh, that's fantastic. Isn't it great? I would have never thought of that. Guys, this is just amazing. What does it mean for both of you to, to be owners of this, of this legacy? This is a legacy I do want to leave. My family, my grandkids, Damien, and this will be around for, I'm hoping and praying, for at least another 100 years, you know? And what does it mean for you, Damien? Oh, it's like you said, just a place where history can keep going. Because the trees were here before us, and they're gonna be here after us, so we're just kinda stewards of the land in the meantime. Let's share a little of this guacamole. Yes, sir. Yep. Let the chips fall where they may, as long as they've got guacamole on them. Avila's El Ranchito is a Southern California staple that's been in business for more than half a century. They've got 13 locations and counting of this family-run chain, but no two restaurants are exactly the same. Every Avila's owner puts their own spin on the family's traditional Mexican recipes. But here at the Seal Beach Outpost, they claim to have the best guacamole. So I've come to learn their secrets. It's time to guac and roll. Hey there, wow, got a lot of folks here. The aunts, uncles, siblings, and cousins behind Avalas El Ranchito really treat their guests like family. This location is run by Elise Avila Smith, a third-generation restaurateur. 
She credits the family's success to her grandma Margarita's hospitality. You know, she just focused on really what we focus on, good, fresh food. Salvador and Margarita, or Mama Avila, immigrated from Mexico to the U.S. in 1958. How did they get into the restaurant business? My father had an opportunity to buy a restaurant and talked to my mother and decided, you know, this is a great opportunity. Salvador using his life savings to purchase the old restaurant property in Huntington Park. He turned to his six kids, including Elisa's dad, Victor, for support. We would go after school and help them do whatever needed to be done. And my father was pretty much during the day taking care of the whole restaurant, and my mother was in the kitchen. So she was in the only one in the kitchen. And then, Grandpa Folder was well, washing yeah. dishes. Mama's traditional recipes have been passed down through many generations. They've come from way, way back in Mexico. When it first opened in 1966, Avila's was the only Mexican restaurant in the mostly white neighborhood. Many customers had no interest in Mama's traditional dishes, so she developed a strategy to draw people in. It seemed like natural for my mother to offer the people whatever they wanted, so mm. it's more like a home. If they didn't have it on the menu, then my mother would go in the kitchen and make it anyway. Over the next three decades, the Avila siblings opened six new restaurants in Southern California. This expansion wasn't a coincidence. Americans at the same time were falling in love with Mexican food. In the early 80s, there were an estimated 2,500 Mexican restaurants in the U.S. Today, there are more than 60,000. I was busting tables here as a child. <laughs> Elise witnessed that growth as a kid, watching her dad expand the family business. So I grew up doing homework in a booth. On top of that, I grew up with my grandparents living one street over from me. So I grew up cooking with her for years and years. After college, Elise tried working in other fields, but she was always drawn back to the restaurants. I'd be working by day, you know, I worked for a magazine. And then my brother opened his first restaurant and I ended up serving tables at night. So no matter what I did, I kept ending up back in this business and I loved it. I realized that this was my passion, it's in my blood. How do you qualify to open up a, an Avila? Well, it's process, let me tell you. <laughs> Is it really? I had to work every position in the restaurant. So I washed dishes, I worked in the kitchen for a few years, but I've done it all. After proving herself for a decade, Elise opened her own Avila's in 2015. When I first opened my restaurant, I worked for several months from about six in the morning till midnight. And finally, I remember my dad and my brother came in for an intervention and said, you need to go home. You gotta sleep. <laughs> you gotta sleep. So I went home and they ran my restaurant for the night. And I knew with my dad and my brother here, there was nothing to worry about. Mm -hmm. Every Avila's restaurant is unique, reflecting the family member who owns it and the location. They have different decor and specialty menu items. Elise puts her own spin on the brand by offering an extensive tequila cocktail menu. Dad, I'm gonna make you a drink right now. Make it strong. <laughs> Salud, mija. But there are several dishes you're gonna find at every location. Avocados are crucial to many of the family recipes, including the signature guacamole and their beloved chicken soup. Tell me about Mama Avila's soup. It's that soup that feels like home to me, but it is a chicken breast and rice soup. We make it from scratch every morning, including the broth. We put fresh avocado, cilantro, onion, and tomato in it. And people go, and the first thing they do when they get off the plane is go to have some chicken soup. You mentioned avocado goes into the soup. Tell me about the importance of avocado. It's part of our culture. Bottom line is nobody wants to eat Mexican food without avocado and some guacamole. <laughs> so I'm curious, first you, Victor, what's the secret to a good guacamole? You have to make it, you know, almost really as on a daily basis, almost an hourly basis. It needs to be fresh. It needs to be well seasoned. And a little bit of love. I like to think I make a good guac, but I, <laughs> I'm sure I can learn from the best. So how about showing me how you guys do guac? Before making some guac, I enjoyed a cucumber margarita and got a taste of Mama's famous soup. That's great. I would never think about avocado in chicken soup. Oh my God. I can't take credit for that one, Al. That's all grandma. <laughs> all right, you ready to make some guacamole? You bet. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do, we're gonna dump some fresh garlic in here. Okay. This is a traditional mocha hete. From there, you're gonna sprinkle a little bit of salt just on top. Just a little bit of salt. Just a little bit of love. And then you're gonna use the 
chopped to go ahead and grind it in there. A mocajete, a Mexican mortar and pestle, is made from volcanic rock. And it's the family secret to great guac. The rough surfaces help crush the ingredients, releasing their natural oils better than chopping them up with a knife. And we're gonna get in some fresh avocado. All right. And then you go ahead and mix that together. And I gotta be gentle with the oh, avocado soft. With, with some love. Gentle, gentle. In go diced onions, lots of cilantro, and a good squeeze of lime juice. Keep on mixing there, and you got yourself some good, fresh guacamole. I'm gonna dig in here with you too, Al. Mm. Oh, yeah. You make good guacamole, Al. <laughs> I've learned from the best. Elise, to be part of something like this, what, what does it mean? Honestly, I feel compelled to keep these beautiful recipes that are from, gosh, my great-great-grandparents running so that everyone that comes to our restaurant is able to taste them and to sit at our table and feel like family and just be a part of ours. Cheers. How does a ceviche bar a little different from a, a sushi bar? It's like a sushi bar, but more Mexican. Uh-huh. <laughs> this lively food court is home to several family-owned hidden gems. In fact, here you'll find Holbush, a modern eatery renowned for its sustainable seafood. The chef behind this vibrant menu pairs flavors from his childhood in Mexico with the freshest of California fare. Gilberto Satina never thought he would dedicate his life to cooking. But his summers spent on the Yucatan Peninsula would later inspire a bold move. Since I was a teenager, growing up in a coastal region, I would go diving with my cousins. We would dive down for octopus, uh, we'd get lobsters, we'd get sea snails. And then he would take that back and cook it. And that was one of the first times that I felt a direct connection to food because even back then, there was a disconnect, you right. know? Food came from the supermarket. And it was the first time I saw something that was like directly from the sea and you can cook it and eat it right away. So that kind of blew my mind. Gilberto immigrated to the U.S. when he was five years old. His father, Gilberto Sr., a former civil engineer, worked various restaurant jobs to support the family. How did your family transition from that kind of grassroots sort of food service to right. a real formal restaurant? It, it really was through the help of the nonprofit that, you know, operates Mercado La Paloma. This bustling market is run by Esperanza, or Hope, a nonprofit dedicated to revitalizing South Los Angeles and helping first-time business owners. They gave us small business training, basic you know, restaurant health department training. They co-signed loans so my dad could purchase the equipment. It was my dad's dream to have a restaurant that represented our Mexican food, the food of the Yucatan, which is very distinct from other regions of Mexico. In 2001, Gilberto Sr. opened the family's first restaurant, Chichen Itza. The menu featuring traditional dishes like conchinita pibil, salbutes, and panuchos. Lo empezamos, la mamá de Gilberto y yo, o sea, mi esposa y yo, 
En, al principio éramos dos personas nada más. They needed help, but Gilberto was reluctant to join the family business. I didn't want to cook. I didn't want to be in the kitchen because I, I grew up in a household where we always, you know, cooking was always used to make ends meet, like a lot of, you know, immigrant families. So when we opened the restaurant and my dad asked me to come along and help him out for six months, I was front of the house. Slowly I just discovered the cooking and that I enjoyed it and, you know, started learning from my dad. Even without formal training, Gilberto quickly learning the ropes, becoming a savvy businessman. Ten years in, Chichen Itza was thriving with dozens of employees. They even released a cookbook. Con el paso de los años, finalmente empezó a sentir la misma pasión que yo tenía por el negocio. After taking over at Chichen Itza, Gilberto was ready for a new challenge, one inspired by those summer boat trips in Mexico. Where does the name Holbosch come from? So Holbosch is a place. It's an island off the coast of the Yucatan Peninsula. He wanted to bring tropical, fresh from the sea vibes, along with an elevated experience, to diners in South Los Angeles. When Holbosch opened in the same market, it changed many perceptions of what Mexican food could be. We go outside of the realm of Yucatan and we do food from all different coastal regions of Mexico. Gilberto's fusion dishes allow the freshest fish to shine. Menu staples include seasonal ceviches and an octopus taco. His innovative cooking has wowed locals and critics alike. How does it feel to be nominated for a James Beard Award for this? Mm. After the shock, I think the first thing that I felt was extreme pride in my team. To a certain level, I guess it feels a little bit like validation because we're doing something slightly outside of the box. You look across Mexican cuisine and, and one of the commonalities is the avocado. Why does the avocado work so well across cuisines in Mexico, but especially your cuisine? The pairing of avocado goes extremely well with raw seafood preparations like ceviches and cocteles, and they're very bright, light, and acidic. I think avocado is the perfect complement because it gives it a little bit, you know, creamy richness. That delicate balance is best represented in the shrimp and scallop aguachiles. And I couldn't wait to try making it. So agua chile is super simple. This is what we're gonna do. We're gonna take, we're gonna make a marinade that's gonna cook or denature our scallops, right? So we're just gonna take some, some cilantro. Uh -huh. Next up, the chili. Serrano peppers bring the heat. Persian cucumbers cool it down. There's a pinch of salt, ice to prevent oxidation, and a squeeze of lime juice. Then the marinade blends for just about a minute. Now, we're just gonna take a bowl. Go ahead and put a couple of uh, spoonfuls of these beautiful Baja California Bay scallops. Ooh, look at those. Now, we're gonna pour the marinade and hold on to the spoon for a stirring. Perfect, that's about right. We wanna let that marinate for at least five minutes. Gilberto takes his agua chile to the next level with an avocado rose. After pitting and peeling, it was time to get slicing. Your knife can be straight because your avocado is at an angle, and we're pull oh. cutting. You're just gonna do this, Al. Look. Okay. The key to a great rose? Super thin slices. We're hiring, you know. <laughs> okay. Now the next step. Hands, right? This We're gonna do this, this motion. We're gonna fan out the okay. avocado, okay. right? So, you see that? Oh, wow. Go. Looking good there. I think that's uh, good enough to roll. You're gonna start at the tip right here, okay. and you just roll this one like that. You see how that's forming a really big flower? Yes. This is a pretty advanced skill, yeah. but I think it's one worth practicing. Oh yeah. And it's a nice party trick, you know? Sure. Impress your friends. Yeah. So, which one should we use? I <laughs> think that one. Made by the professional. Time to plate it up. That's looking beautiful. You're a lot neater doing this than I am. I'll yeah. take like a spoonful of them and just yeah. drop it on there and then arrange them on the plate. Ah, pro tip. And of course, the finishing touches. Wow. This is our scallop aguachile. And I help make it. Can something this pretty taste as good as it looks? Mm. 
that was actually the bike. <laughs> That's amazing. Thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. But yet so simple. Thank you, sir. Al, it was a pleasure. Fantastic. The Haas Avocado may have started out as a lucky surprise, but for decades, its popularity has been no accident. The Mexican-American culinary traditions passed down through the years have made this delicious and nutritious fruit a staple for so many of us across the country. And thanks to generations of enterprising families, this bumpy green fruit is going to have a very long shelf life. In the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, Black-owned restaurants weren't just places to get a meal, several becoming crucial meeting spots for activists at the forefront of the civil rights movement. And the families still operating these restaurants today are committed to honoring their historic legacies. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're gonna learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. We're in Harlem, the epicenter of black culture in the United States. Now, many historians agree the Harlem Renaissance paved the way for the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s. So in this episode, we're traveling across the country to explore three legendary black-owned restaurants. For generations, these beloved eateries have been serving up dishes to historic figures and those fighting for change. First up, we're heading south to visit an iconic establishment that defied segregation laws. New Orleans, a city that celebrates food, music, nightlife, and history. In the Big Easy, you'll find many historic sites that played a vital role in the civil rights movement, like William France Elementary School, where six-year-old Ruby Bridges broke barriers in 1960. Or New Zion Baptist Church, a hub for activists. And Treme, one of the oldest black neighborhoods in America. Here, you'll find the only restaurant on the U.S. Civil Rights Trail. Ducky Chase Restaurant definitely is a historical landmark institution here in New Orleans. This popular eatery is a living testament to a woman who changed the face of fine dining in America, Chef Leah Chase. I'm Stella Chase Reese, and I am the president of the corporation here at Ducky Chase's. And I'm Edgar Duck Chase IV, and I'm the executive chef here at Ducky Chase Restaurant. Stella's grandparents first opened Dookie Chase's as a po'boy shop, becoming a full-service restaurant in 1941. African Americans didn't have that place to celebrate, to celebrate birthdays, to celebrate promotions, to celebrate good grades, weddings, proms. So they opened up a place where that could happen. But the next generation had a new vision for the eatery. It was my father, Edgar Chase, Jr. and his wife, Leah Lange Chase, that continued the legacy that my grandparents started. Dookie Chase Jr. was an avid jazz musician who promoted some of America's first integrated concerts. His friendship with all the musicians, Ray Charles and Duke Ellington and Sarah Vaughan, we would hear stories of them after their performance coming here to dine at Ducky Chase. And Leah was determined to bring an elevated dining experience for her black patrons. She wanted the best china. She wanted linens. She wanted them to be served the best they could be served because she didn't want our community to be deprived of anything else than any other community had. That community was on the brink of a revolution, years in the making. Post-1865 and the Emancipation Proclamation, with the masses of African American people now free, the country was overwhelmed. Hierarchies needed to be reestablished. It was important from a white supremacist point of view that black folks knew their place. By the late 19th century, Jim Crow laws legalizing racial segregation in the former Confederate states. Those laws were further cemented by the Supreme Court case Plessy versus Ferguson, which upheld the separate but equal doctrine. But Dookie Chases defied those laws welcoming patrons of all races to dine and discuss political issues facing the black community. 
their willingness and, and openness to everyone in the community made them a hub of safety, made them a hub of belonging. But that openness also made the Chase family a target. There were times that we had people throw things in and try to, you know, destroy the peace. But that didn't frighten my parents. They continued because they know what they were doing was the correct thing to do. By the 1960s, Dookie Chases had become a go-to spot where activists could connect and strategize. We had the opportunity to serve many of our civil rights leaders, Martin Luther King, Jesse Jackson, Rosa Parks, Thurgood Marshall. The list goes on and on. And then Freedom Bus Riders, they came here. My parents realized that until we all learn to enjoy life together and get to that part where social justice would be for everyone, that this community or any other community in our country would not grow and will not be better. In the 1970s, Leah becoming passionate about promoting black artists. Her love of art was also celebrated here at Dookie Chases when she gave African-American artists the opportunity to actually display their art on her wall because at the time, they had no place to display their art. Her extraordinary life even becoming the inspiration for Disney's first black princess, Tiana. It meant a lot for her because she did have some of the kids dress up and come here. Leah Chase, the queen of Creole cuisine, passing away on June 1st, 2019. But her spirit and her culinary traditions are in vigilant and capable hands. This is Leah Chase's kitchen. It's set up the same way and we love it like that because as you know, she's still with us. She's still watching us. Chef Duke continues to serve Creole cuisine that's been on the menu for decades. From red beans and rice to shrimp clemenceau and the famous chicken a la Dookie. But the restaurant's most popular dish, gumbo. You think back to the civil rights era when we had leaders strategizing in our upstairs dining room. We fed them gumbo. You think about presidents today, President Barack Obama, President George Bush came here. We always started them with gumbo because my grandmother always believed that her gumbo will solve any problems. And we like to say her gumbo changed the course of America. Gumbo, an official state food of Louisiana. Dookie Chase's version has a little something for everyone. Not one, but two types of sausage. Some Louisiana blue crab. What we do here is we take the top shell off, we clean it up, and we just crack it in half, release some of those flavors. In. Chicken and shrimp. This is really coming out to be a beautiful gumbo. The gumbo simmering until it's ready to serve. I mean, if you just smell this, the neighborhood smelling this, everybody knows when Dookie Chase is cooking gumbo. Today, the Chase empire is expanding. Chef Duke just opened the family's newest restaurant, Chapter 4. Being a fourth generation African American restaurant tour is huge. Many generations now working side by side. Being around my family all day, that's the biggest blessing. I'm so grateful that I get to work with all my family and it's such a joy. And that joy best expressed over great food. Hello, family. Hey, yes. Enjoying everything. Exactly. We it's are great enjoying food. everything. Yeah. What's the song that Rachel? I'm going down to Dookie Chase, Chase to, to get, get myself my some gumbo. When, when the service is right, they treat you nice. nice. The whole restaurant, Dookie Chase's, is a, is a gift to the family that was given by my great grandparents. And so we want to make sure that, you know, the restaurant sustains that legacy and all the traditions. Leah Chase said, food bills, big bridges. If you can eat with someone, you can learn from them. And when you learn from someone, you can make big changes. We can change the course of America in this restaurant over a bowl of gumbo. We can talk to each other and relate to each other. When we eat together.
A trip to Harlem just wouldn't be complete without a meal here at Sylvia's Restaurant. This neighborhood institution has been serving up soul food since 1962. And what started as a small luncheonette has now become a family empire, beloved by tourists, locals, and plenty of famous faces. The cornbread was sweet, it was warm, and it just reminded me of home. It took me back to my grandmother's cooking, so I really enjoyed it. What brought me here today was that I was hungry and wanted some good soul food. So where do you go in Harlem? Sylvia's. Soul food is the cultural identity marker that really surmises our journey as a people living in America. Trinesse Woods Black is the granddaughter of the legendary queen of soul food, Sylvia Woods. Sylvia grew up in Hemingway, South Carolina, where she met her love, Herbert Woods, when they were 11 and 12. They fell in love picking beans after school. But this entrepreneur-to-be wasn't content with life on the farm. My grandmother, um, she came to New York when she was 16. She knew that this was a place that was more palatable for African Americans to like really live. Sylvia and Herbert were among the estimated six million African Americans who left the Jim Crow South during the Great Migration. They had came, you know, north to escape all of the atrocities that were happening and to really be in control of their lives. If you were black, you know, Harlem was the place to be. Sylvia finding work at a diner Johnson's Luncheonette, which she eventually purchased from the owner with a loan from her mom. Mr. Johnson knew that my grandmother would make it. And on August 1st, 1962, Sylvia's Restaurant was born. As the cultural center of black America, Harlem became a crucial site for demonstrations and organizing by leaders like Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X according to Professor Psyche williams Porson, The heart of civil rights is America, because it wasn't limited to one, one area. Though folks were in the North, they still experienced poverty and inequality and voter suppression and homelessness. Sylvia made the restaurant a welcoming place for activists. She played her role as ensuring that the community leaders had a place to, to meet and to commune and to strategize. Everyone dined at Sylvia's, Dizzy Gillespie, Ozzy Davis, Ruby Dee. You know, these are actors and actresses that were on the front line. By the 1960s, the movement had achieved major gains, like the historic Brown versus Board of Education and successful boycotts. But racial discrimination and police brutality against black Americans persisted, resulting in deadly riots throughout the decade. Two devastating events, just four years apart, sparked destructive riots throughout Harlem. But Sylvia's was always spared. Harlem was on fire, and my grandmother kept the restaurant open because the grocery stores were not open. Nothing was open. You know, people couldn't feed their kids. And she was in that kitchen making food so that this community would have something to eat. This strong connection with Harlemites has continued for decades. We have guests that eat with us every single day. And sometimes we have people that eat with us multiple times a day. Coming up, I learned the secret to Sylvia's famous fried chicken.
Sylvia's in Harlem has been serving up soul food since 1962. And this native New Yorker couldn't wait to get back into their historic dining room. <laughs> oh, wow. it's, it's so, so good, good to, to see, see you. It's been so long. It's been mm. way too long. I've missed you. I've missed you too. But you know what? The good thing about Sylvia's is it's like I saw you yesterday. It's coming home. It's coming it's home. It's coming home. The dining room walls showcasing famous faces and political figures along with treasured memories. This picture is one of my grandmother's favorites. This was when Winnie and Nelson Mandela came to New York when he was freed. Eating here has become a rite of passage for many candidates. And there's a young man, I don't know whatever happened to this guy. You know, I think he might have turned out okay. I, I think, think so. He, yeah. After a meal here, After yeah. This is what sent him on his path. That's right. It's the, it was the chicken. It was the chicken. <laughs> but the heart of Sylvia's is Harlem. Triness and her family have worked hard to stay active in the neighborhood, from funding college scholarships for local teens to supporting Black Lives Matter events. What is it about this restaurant that keeps people coming back? Authenticity. Authenticity times love. Sylvia's, when you come to Sylvia's, you know what you're going to get. You're going to get some good food that's going to make you feel warm. Today, over a dozen family members help run Sylvia's empire, which includes a catering business and a successful food product line. What's it like working with family? Because I know your brother Marcus, yes. your baby brother Marcus, baby brother. is there in the kitchen. What's that like? Watching my brother throw down in the kitchen is something that we always knew was going to happen. Executive chef Marcus Woods has been at the helm for five years. Sylvia's grandson, it is so good to see you. Yeah. And you're back here, you're running the kitchen. What, what's that like for you? I mean, knowing that this legacy your grandmother's had. I'm honored, I'm honored. I still get to cook for people like you in the, the community of Harlem. So as long as I can do that, I'm happy and always honored and blessed. You know, the amazing thing is food brings people together. You look in that, that, that dining room, everybody's there. Yes. Well, so, so we used to always say that the first time you come to Sylvia's, you're a guest, the second time you're family. According to Marcus, fried chicken, the most beloved menu item. So did your grandmother teach you how to do this? Yes, she taught me how to fry chicken, everything down to the seasoning. She would always say, you know, moisturize chicken and marinate it like you're putting lotion on a baby. Now, now I can't get that image out of my head exactly. now. One secret, Chef Marcus first applied a dry rub to marinate the chicken. Now is that just plain, plain flour? Yeah, this is plain flour. Uh -huh. We add a little coarse black pepper to it. Uh-huh. Drop them all in there. You just want to give it a little mix. Again, the baby metaphor. The baby metaphor. Like you're tossing the baby. After the chicken's coated, it gets a gentle shake. Then it's into the deep fryer. That looks like tender love and care right there. Oh, yeah. See how gently he's putting it in there. Putting the baby to bed. Yep, they'll let you know when they're ready to wake up. What's the best part of working here? That every day when I walk in, I get to feel like my grandmother's still with me. Oh, yeah. Wow. Like I feel her, I, I can really feel her presence in this place. And it reminds me, every time you're feeling a little lazy, it's like, all right, she's watching. <laughs> you gotta pick up, your, pick up the pace. And she treated everybody the same. Uh -huh. Celebrity, normal person, Worker, dishwasher, cook, chef. Yeah. I don't know if I could ever live up to who she was, but I'm going to. I'm gonna try. She was an amazing person. After about 15 minutes, golden perfection. Wow, that looks perfect. Now, this now is you're where, a thigh person. This is, so I, I know what you're going person. for. Oh, I remember how good this is. That's perfect. Perfect. Wow, the seasoning, it's moist, crisp. Oh, your grandmother's smiling right now. That's Sylvia's fried chicken right there. You treated the baby well. Mm -hmm. Marcus, this is fantastic. It's so great to see you. Yeah. If, if you don't mind, I'm gonna take this piece to go. Oh, I'm gonna pack up a whole bunch for you. Thank you.
Welcome back. In Oakland, California, Lois the Pie Queen has been serving up Southern specialties, hospitality, and of course, fabulous pies since the 1950s. But it's more than just a space for delectable food. It's a well-known hub for political activists, artists, musicians, and everyday folks to meet, mix, and collaborate. Come on down to Lois the Pie Queen. Get your breakfast on and the mean green. Lois the Pie Queen is serving up much more than brunch staples. It's just a great place for locals to come, great place for people to connect. And it's just awesome that I can come to a place like this and have some soul food. My name is Chris Davis, and I'm owner of Lois the Pie Queen. We serve food that warms the soul. This family's roots run deep in Northern California. Lois Davis, Chris's mom, began selling homemade pies at her church in the 1940s. They were an instant hit. Her husband, Roland, dubbed her the Pie Queen and saw a new business opportunity. My dad was a chef at B&G Foods in San Francisco, and they combined both of their efforts to open up the restaurant and serve breakfast, lunch, and dinner. In 1953, the duo opening their Oakland restaurant. So my mother ran the restaurant for 40 years, and uh, it started at 4.30 in the morning for her and ended at 11 at night, and uh, she was a pure perfectionist. Lois perfecting recipes she enjoyed growing up. The recipes were my grandmother's recipes. My grandmother was from Texas and they have maintained the test of time. All of the items that are on the menu were pretty much on the menu when my mom started the restaurant. From key lime pie topped with raspberry jam to banana cheesecake, sweet treats are always popular here. But there are plenty of savory staples that keep customers coming back every morning. And there's one dish with a special place in many folks' hearts. You might not find salmon croquettes on the menu anywhere in the Bay Area. The salmon croquettes are part salmon, part mackerel, yellow onions, salt and pepper, Italian breadcrumbs. These croquettes, which originated in the South, were a meal staple for many black families. Most black folks couldn't afford crab you know, once it became popularized. But in the absence of that, canned fish, salmon croquettes became a major filler. With a couple of cans, families could make an affordable yet delicious meal. Lois's dishes have brought in celebrities from Sammy Davis Jr. to Zendaya. And sports icons like Reggie Jackson ate here so often, they actually named a pork chop special after him. So here's my wall of fame and some of the special people that are up here. This is Black Panther Party Minister Eldridge Cleaver. All power to the people! In the 1960s and 70s, Lois welcomed members of the newly formed Black Panther Party. The restaurant is a short drive from Merritt Community College, where activists Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale first met, founding the party in 1966. Chris attended Merritt with both of them. I had Eldridge Cleaver, Angela Davis, Bobby Seale, and Huey P. Newton come through the restaurant. Civil rights leaders and organizers and community leaders would come and meet and organize and strategize. There was a lot of uh, electricity in the restaurant uh, when they visited. The Black Panthers have a controversial legacy. The story we tend to hear is one of violence. What we don't hear about as much are the various lunch programs and, and free breakfast, of course. They saw black communities as in and of themselves resilient, capable of being self-sufficient. Lois and Chris were not members of the party, but it was during this era the restaurant became an important gathering space in the Oakland community for different walks of life. When people come and are needy and ask for food, we always do what my mom did, which was we always take care of them. We always give them a meal. The restaurant expanding this mission amid the pandemic, providing 16,000 meals to locals in need. It is a place for people to come and, uh, and get together and try and figure out how to make uh, our community and our world a better place. Today, that mission to help others has evolved. 
Chris uses his platform to support local musicians and keep the restaurant buzzy by bringing in younger generations. I believe that that aspect of music and musicianship is something that is in the ethos of the restaurant. Hey, Mr. Jackson, how are you? Good, I'm doing good, babe. Good. He recently started a music management company for Wise Men Entertainment that he unofficially runs from the tables at Lois. It's not an accident or a coincidence that you look around and see a lot of photographs of, you know, famous folks. There's a lot of people that he supports. And I don't mean support just by putting up pictures up. He'll cultivate young artists that are looking to get an opportunity to get a platform where they can be seen and heard. Would you like hash browns, grits, or rice? Grits, of course grits. Chris is determined to keep the restaurant in the family. His son, Corey Jackson, has been overseeing the day-to-day -day at Lois for nearly five years. Working with my dad gave me an understanding of not only the hard work my grandmother put forward and how much my dad is trying to fill those shoes, and now I'm trying to fill his. Corey hoping his sons will share the passion for the family business. They can't stay away. They have a job right now. They fold silverware. It's great to see my kids and their Papa Chris bond in those times. Chris thinks Lois would be incredibly proud to see her restaurant continuing to thrive. We are the oldest black restaurant in the Bay Area. It is a tribute to my mom's efforts to support her community and to create a place that was a home away from home and a place that served food that warmed the soul. <laughs> As you might imagine, keeping a restaurant running for decades is no easy feat, especially in the face of adversity. But with delicious dishes and unwavering hospitality, these historic hotspots have nourished generations fighting for social change. These places now stand as symbols of resilience, inspiring and feeding a new generation of community leaders. I love the city of Baltimore. I've been coming here for years. And if there's one thing I know, the city of Baltimore is serious about his crab. I love Baltimore crabs. This is the, the, the stomping and grind of crabs. And I've been eating crabs since the time I could sit up at a table. It's a little spicy, salty, and savory, all in one. If I could describe the taste, you can. You just have to try it. <laughs> you just have to try it. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. When you think Maryland, you got to think blue crab, an essential part of the state's culture and cuisine. And no place knows how to cook it up quite like Baltimore. I mean, just as many ways as you can count, you can find ways to eat crab. Of course, there's your basic, your, your steamed crab with the beautiful spices, and you just start whacking that bad boy. You can get all that beautiful meat out. You can get cra canned crab if you'd like. Uh, of course, there's also the fabulous crab mac and cheese with a hot dog. There's the crab dip, there's your crab soup, and of course, the king of crab, the crab cake. Yes, but this is a cake that needs no icing. Mm. Crab cakes have been enjoyed by many for centuries throughout the Chesapeake region, but here in Baltimore, they're a way of life. And one of the city's most popular go-tos is tucked away just inside the world-famous Lexington Market. We're headed back to Houston today and we wanted to have the best crab cake in town. We're from Orlando, glad to be here. People have been coming to Fabies for years. Yes. Ever since I was little and I'm um, 25. 
people from all around the world come here to Baltimore just to grab a bite of the famous Fadley's Crab Cake. It's made with fresh Maryland crab and family love. Everybody looks the same. How are you, my dear? Hello. Hello, hello. So good to see you. <laughs> How are you, sir? You looking good? You're looking great. Got something for you. All right. There you go. There you go. You need one of those. Oh, yeah. There you are. Now I'm feeling really crabby. <laughs> Pardon me. I've, I've got to get a lawyer because there's a clause I have to have checked. <laughs> I've known the folks at Fadley Seafood for years, but they've been serving up fresh crab cakes even longer. Hi, I'm uh, Nancy Fadley. I own Fadley Seafood. It's been uh, in my family now for, well, four generations, and the fifth is coming up, so we've been around a long time. I think people are astonished to see my parents at 84 and 89 still working. You can get another five cans and do a second batch if you need to with them. People ask her for her autograph, they ask her for a picture, they ask her to hold their babies. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really fun. I mean, here's this company that's been part of Baltimore for over 130 years. Yeah, right. Uh, what, why, what, what is it about your place that has people coming back? Right. I think it's that people come in here and go right away. There's a warmth. Uh -huh. There, it's like walking to somebody's home. That's they're they're happy to have you. Uh -huh. You know, come and you feel. Oh my gosh, I feel at home. And I get people. We were here 20 years. It's exactly the same. In fact, Fadley still stands in its original location, founded here by John W. Fadley Sr. in 1886. Started off as a seafood stall, but over the generations grew into a Baltimore tradition, led by Bill and Nancy Devine along with their daughter. Damie Hahn, and I am the fourth generation of Fadley's, so I do everything. <laughs> Give them a little bit of a smorgasbord of, of everything. Going over here to fillet a fish, over here to shuck an oyster, over there to steam a crab, back here to fry, up here to make a crab cake, back down on the phone, running in the shipping department. A tray like that is about uh, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight bushels of crabs in order to get that tray. That's a lot of picking, and I don't think people realize how much work goes into getting an all jumbo lump. Growing up, did you did you think you were going to end up here? You were going to be doing this? No, <laughs> no, but it was hard to get away from, and I couldn't see it going away. I couldn't see, see it ending with my parents. So... The pandemic hit. Yes. And you really had to step up. My father called me and I said, Dad, you guys cannot come in here. You know, the, we, we don't know anything about this this virus and, and the effects, especially on the elderly. And I know you want to be here, but you can't. And he said, Damien, do whatever you do, whatever you can to make payroll. It just makes me cry when I think about it. Um, he said, just make sure that we don't have to lay anybody off. I don't want to lay anybody off. I don't want anybody to lose their job. And we did it. And I saw it back when I came here in the 90s, and I still see it today. This truly is a family. Oh, it is a family. <laughs> and, it, and it's funny because I often tell people, mom and dad don't treat the employees any differently than they treat me. And that's the God's honest good, truth. <laughs> which could be a good or a bad. That's the God's honest truth. And that's why you end up having so many multi-generation families staying here. That's right. Fadley's isn't just a family-owned business. It's run by family as well. Multiple generations of employees, father and daughter, father and son, mom and daughter, all building a home here. I've been here since a junior in high school, so I've been doing the thing for a while. I'm going to say it's been around 33, 34 years. And I started at the end of 79, a uh, week before my son was born. I started at 14 years old, and I'll be 42 years old in December. It's always a challenge working with family. <laughs> a lot of personalities, but you love each other, and it always works, you know, it always works well. What's, what's really, really bad is when your kids are grandmothers. 
Mom, we were in the middle of an interview. <laughs> oh, you just broke in. <laughs> you have to start over. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you, 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 you were saying about the challenges of working with family? <laughs> While the family spirit makes customers feel at home, it's Fadley's crab cakes that keep them coming back. What kind of oil do you cook your crab cakes in? Soybean. Soybean, thank you. I'm so excited to have this crab cake. And I watch people for the first time put it in their mouth and they go, oh my God. <laughs> and, I go, and they're standing at a table in a market. Yeah. They're not sitting down to a white tablecloth and having somebody serve it on a silver platter. It's on a paper plate, but it's it belongs on a silver platter. Nancy created a recipe in 1987, saying she's never changed it. So, besides yourself, how many other people know the Fadley's crab cake recipe? Sleep with her, she won't tell me. <laughs> he doesn't even know how to make a cup of coffee. <laughs> Why would I tell him? <laughs> so some people use breadcrumbs. You use it's crushed broken, up saltines. Salty, broken saltines, yes. And not, not fine because no. you have to use more. Now, so, and then this is the magic sauce. Is this the secret sauce? Yes. So it's just enough to mix the ingredients it's together, right. nothing more. That's right. And the fine big head. ball of crab right there. That's it. Boom. This. Oh boy. Oh. It's just like I remember eating it 26 years ago. You know what? I'm told that all the time when people come in here. The best part about this is you haven't changed a thing. Now, this is a legacy. Well, we know how the crabs end up, but how do they get them? Let's go find out. Coming up, the generations of black watermen who've made a living pulling in Maryland's most famous catch. The Chesapeake Bay men and women who work these waters are probably just as famous as the legendary catch that they pull out. And in fact, it's backbreaking work that is passed on from generation to generation, including blackjacks. Those were the black watermen who worked these waters all the way back into the 1800s and are a vital part of this community. The Chesapeake Bay is home to a vast variety of seafood, but none as valuable or as well known as the blue crab. 
The catch here makes up over a third of the nation's supply, and on average, more than 50 million pounds of blue crabs are harvested from the bay. I'm Captain Tyrone Meredith, charter boat captain, owner and operator of the Island Queen 2. Captain Meredith knows these waters well. He grew up on them. I'm the fourth generation uh, waterman, and my grand, great grandfather, he worked on the water, my grandfather, and my father. We've been here ever since the 1860s, making a living working on the Chesapeake Bay. This has been the way of life for generations of watermen here in Kent Narrows, a town just 50 miles south of Baltimore. For hundreds of years, they've caught, processed, and sold blue crabs to markets up and down the eastern shore. By the mid to late 1800s, Kent Narrows had also become one of many unlikely havens on the bay for free and enslaved African Americans. There was more black uh, watermen anywhere on the whole East Coast, probably in the United States. Those watermen, also known as blackjacks, forged their path to liberation on the water. Their expertise is essential to the booming seafood industry. So much so, the government granted some black watermen seamen's protection certificates, providing sailors with American citizenship and a path to economic freedom. Hey, Lewis, I'm coming up on you now. Okay, I got you. Yeah. How they biting today? This morning it looked pretty good. Well, being out here is your own boss. You do what you want to do and let nobody tell you, go get me this or go get me that. 75-year-old Lewis Carter still finds that same sense of freedom on the water today. He's also one of the last generations of black watermen alive. Every morning before the sun rises, he sets out to catch crabs in the bay. I started in 1961, I was bay 15, and I've been at it ever since. Right now, uh, I'm going down the line, and uh, when I get to the other end, I'll throw it off. Crabs will come up on that bait. The pressure from the water pushes them back in this dipper. Okay, these are the big, large males. You put them in one basket. That's a female with red claws. Put them in one basket. He's one of the last Mohegans left. Not too many people that still work, make a living from the water. Most of them moved away, got all the jobs, and it's changing because it's harder to make a living from the bay. Crabbing season runs from spring into late fall, but changes in climate, cost, and labor have made each successive year more challenging. As younger generations take up new trades, there are less people working the waters and ultimately fewer black watermen. Back when I started, it was a plenty of black water, but they died out and the younger ones never taken their place. It, in, a, in one way, it makes me feel bad, you know, and I don't think it'll be no chance no more black water. I really do believe that. Captain Meredith estimates there are fewer than a dozen black watermen on the bay. Like many of his peers, he's had to turn to other work. Back when I was crabbing teenager, I caught highs 50 bushel a day. Right now, crab is catching two or three bushel a day. Now I started running charters, fishing charters, because crabbing started declining and, and the fishing was more lucrative money-wise. And educational. His charters are an opportunity to keep stories of the blackjacks alive for generations ahead. Although tradition on these waters is changing, one thing remains the same. Nothing tastes like the Chesapeake Bay Maryland crab. It's got that certain taste to them. And it, it, it's the only place like that in the world is the Chesapeake Bay Blue Crab. Next, an up and coming Baltimore chef inspired by his family's love of cooking.
Back in Baltimore, a new generation is putting a spin on the crab cake. So I'm Alex Perez. I'm the owner of Poppy Cuisine. I'm an artist at heart. So uh, cooking, um, the arts of culinary, you know, that's something that I'm very passionate about. Not necessarily having a recipe to go off of and just getting in the kitchen, freestyling and coming up with a masterpiece. It's that freestyling approach that brings people through these doors, clamoring for a taste. Jumbo, crab, crab is king in Baltimore, so um, you're going to see crab cakes, uh, crab cake fries, crab cake egg rolls. Everyone's been going crazy over it as well. This is the ball. So I just come back for that and I enjoy it every time I come here. We actually live in D.C., so we rode all the way up here an hour just to come here. Right now I'm drizzling our warhead and our aioli sauces on it. I have a family from the Dominican Republic. I'm Afro-Latino. I'm black on my mother's side. And pretty much I've um, always had a love for food and uh, cooking food, eating food. So learning how to cook from my, my dad. So my dad taught me how to cook at the age of 10. I grew up, you know, watching my grandmother cook a, a lot as well. So I started pretty much combining the uh, foods that I learned to cook from my grandmother with the foods I learned how to cook from my father. And that's kind of like how the uh, whole poppy cuisine, you know, was, was born it's in her kitchen, essentially. That was eight years ago. While working a full-time job, Alex began building a new business on the side, catering food out of his grandma's kitchen. In February 2020, he was finally able to open a restaurant. Then the pandemic hit. Of course, you know, a month later, we get the news that we have to shut down and only do takeout. So that just opened up the, uh, the, the floodgates, essentially. And you have people standing in line hundreds of people <laughs> on the block and in that mass, you know, cars double parked up and down the streets. And it was it was just may it was mayhem. During a global crisis, the city Alex was born and raised in rallied around him. Now, Poppy Cuisine is packed with locals and tourists alike. But the chef stays true to his roots, running it with close family and friends. My little sister, Natasha. Hi. <laughs> How's it going? Natasha. My big bro, Alex. I can employ family members, friends, and so forth, you know, that are people who I grew up with, people that I'm close to, and it's very rewarding, you know? Coming up, I'm going to grab my apron and join Alex and Grandma Gloria for a lesson in cooking crap. I wanted to meet Alex and his grandma Gloria, the inspiration behind his cooking. So I dropped by their kitchen to say hello. Well, I know I picked up from my grandmother, my mother-in-law, and um, just put my own spin on certain dishes. I didn't follow it to the, the recipe to the letter. So you're able to add a little bit. Yeah, but he's always asked me uh, when I fix the dish, well, what did you put in this? How did you do, how did you do this? And I would tell him, I said, you don't have to follow to the letter, you know, put your own spin. And Alex has done just that, turning the classic crab cake into an egg roll. Genius! 
genius. The ingredients, simple. A pound of jumbo lump crab, panko breadcrumbs, aged cheddar cheese, egg roll wrappers, and a couple of sauces and micro greens to top it off. There's the star of the show, the crab meat. Put on an apron, I've got rubber gloves on. All right, patient's ready. So how do we get started, Alex? Yeah, so first what you wanna do is say we have some uh, Maryland jumbo lump crab here. Uh -huh. So for the most part, I shouldn't have much shells in, but mm -hmm. uh, typically uh, I like to sift through it. Just gotta see if there's any shells, and if so, you can put the shells right back in this oh. uh, container. There you go. So, Gloria, did you know you were ra helping raise a, a culinary genius? <laughs> well, no, but I know he liked to eat. <laughs> <laughs> this sauce particular is our, our crab sauce mix. So we're going to drizzle a little bit at a time. Because I don't want to put too much. Right. Just enough to uh, bind. You got enough for Al? Yep, I think I'll have enough. Oh, she's she's stay me. I like this. I like this lady. This is why I'm so particular uh, about you know when I'm doing things in the kitchen. Uh huh. Gonna start actually rolling these things up. Yes. Why? Why? Why do you think this this recipe is, is so popular at the restaurant? The most popular. Um, well, I think uh, because it, it pretty much gives you the ability to uh, take a, a bar more favorite and you know make it handheld and on, on the go. Uh -huh. You know, throw in your hand. Kind of street food. Really. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's one of the, the biggest reasons it's, it's very popular. Other than the taste as well. Right, well, exactly. You know, <laughs> yeah, because that's You can take taste. it with you, but if it's not great, right, right, exactly. right. uh, come back for it. Yeah, so what we're going to um, do is uh, we're going to take like a, a pinch of uh, crab. It's around like a yeah, quarter cup or so. Mm -hmm. We're gonna sit in the middle. Not too yeah. much. Yeah, we wanna take a little bit out, a little pinch out. Actually, we wanna put a little bit more in. Yeah. Which is it? <laughs> All right, so that's perfect right there. That's perfect, right, perfect. <laughs> and we're gonna literally fold them up envelope style. What is it about cooking and family that that, that is so important? Yeah, I think uh, for me. Um, you know, living a, a busy life as a business owner and a dad, a husband, things like that. Mm -hmm. I feel like uh, food is a uh, opportunity for family to come together, you know, talk about things, especially if you haven't seen each other in a long time. And, mm -hmm. You know, it's a way for us to connect, so. Hey, and is, it, is it true you've never done this before? No, I haven't. It's true. Oh. Could have fooled me that you never did this before. Look at that. <laughs> Bam! You done! Faster than I did. Wow! <laughs> Yeah. Wow, that natural grandma thing. Love it. So now we're gonna get get the deep fryer up here and fry these bad boys up. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Woo! You have to describe the heart of your cuisine. What is it, and and how does Baltimore uh, kind of part of that? Pretty much my my story, and uh, I think that connects very well to our Baltimore. You know because. You know, I, I grew up here, you know, all my life. And I think everything that um, I faced during the time that, you know, I, I started this company up until now, I've been transparent about that. And it resonated very well with the uh, the, uh, the people in Baltimore. And they, they watched my journey through the years. And I feel like that's that's really the, the heart of what mm -hmm. I did. Make sure and it's having around the edges and then things like that. So that's why I keep turning them, you know, so it doesn't fry uh -huh. on one particular side too much. And, Want to even fry? Ooh. Nice and golden. So you want to cut these diagonally. So, yeah. so I'm going to drizzle. This is our aioli sauce, house made, and this is our warhead sauce right here. <laughs> so the sauce is kind of sweet, has a tangy bite to it. Oh, kind of like Gloria. <laughs> <laughs> yep, it's right. Well, I guess there's only thing, one thing left to do. Yeah, I'm trying to Yeah, yeah. Crab cake egg roll. Yeah. Here we go. Wow, Chef Alex, you have done Baltimore proud. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Our time here in Baltimore is coming to an end. We tried the traditional crab cake. 
tasted a modern spin with crab cake egg rolls and even went straight to the source on the Chesapeake Bay. At the center of it all, one thing still ringing true, food tastes better when you eat it with family. When most of us think about Detroit, Motown, car manufacturing, even sports comes to mind. But when it comes to food, the folks here in the Motor City are all about one famous Frank, the Coney Dog. And no, we're not talking about Coney Island in New York. In Michigan, a Coney is both a diner to locals and a hot dog smothered in chili, topped with onions, and finished off with a <laughs> of mustard. Now, there are dozens of Coneys in the Detroit metro area. Some bear the Coney Island name, others don't. But you'll always find some type of sausage, a bun, and a signature meat sauce on the menu. So what makes Michigan crazy for Coney's? Let's find out. The relationship be between Coney's and Detroit, it's a long relationship. It's a long love story. <laughs> the Coney is, is a part of Detroit. If you can drive and eat a Coney, it's not a Detroit style Coney in my opinion. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. Welcome to Detroit. What do you say we travel back in time to the earliest days of the Coney? The folks at American Coney Island have been dishing up this local specialty for more than 100 years. In fact, this restaurant and the one next door, well, they've got a shared history. But American has been run by the same family for three generations. Founded by a Greek immigrant, this restaurant story is synonymous with the legendary hot dog of this city. What do you say we go meet the family? One to go plain, one fry. At American Coney Island, hot dogs aren't just a meal, they're memories. Grace Kiros is the third generation owner of this legendary spot. Grace. Al. Hi, good to see you again. Good to see you. It's been a long time. It is. We sat down to talk Coney traditions, turning points, and of course, toppings. People are very passionate about their Coney Island hot dog. Here. Yes, they are. Why? Because it holds a nostalgia and a tradition to them. We see daily generations of people coming in here. Remember grandpa bringing them, my mom brought me. It, it's part of their growing up, it's part of their life. 30 years ago, Grace took over the restaurant reins from her dad, Chuck Kiros. Chuck inheriting the business from his father, founder Constantine Kiros, AKA Gust. Your place, this place on this corner, has been here for 105 years. What is it like being really part of the fabric of, of an iconic city like Detroit? Yeah, it's surreal. I mean, I think back to my grandfather and my dad and the things they saw here from, from riots to Tigers winning the World Series when they were good. Such a deep history and, and proud. Mm -hmm. I love this city. The Coney craze in Detroit is really a legacy of the Kiros family. Historian Joe Grimm co-writing the book on Coney's in the Motor City. The Kiroses came to Detroit from Dara in Greece, where this was a sheep herding town, and they needed to find work. And they really struck gold, as in the color of mustard, when they started making these Coney Island hot dogs. In the late 1800s, Greece was facing a massive economic crisis setting off a wave of global migration. By 1920, it's estimated that over 400,000 Greeks immigrated to the United States seeking new opportunities. Like most European immigrants of the era, they passed through New York before moving on to other parts of the country. They entered, most of them, through Ellis Island, which is near Coney Island. They saw people on Coney Island and in New York eating hot dogs and said, ah, we're gonna go into the hot dog business, but we're gonna top it with something Greek now, the true origins, like who invented the Coney Dog, lost to history. It just sort of happened in a lot of places in about the same time, mostly by Greek immigrants. Gust and his brother, Bill Kuros, opening one of Detroit's first Coney shops in the early 1900s. A family rift 
caused the brothers to split, leading to side-by-side -side Coney operations and a long-lasting restaurant rivalry. Detroiters swearing allegiance to American or Lafayette, but only American is still owned by the Kiros family today. We figure well more than 100 Coney Islands can trace their lineage directly to that flat top grill. Each Coney spot in the Detroit area and throughout Michigan has its own history, from National to Kirby's to Nicky D's, from Berkeley Coney Island to L. George's to Leo's and more. But all of the city's Coney's have a similar foundation, starting with a steamed bun. You add a beef and pork hot dog. Then it's covered with a chili sauce. And the chili sauce is where Coney owners can improvise and innovate. And then on top of that, it's going to be a yellow salad mustard and diced onions and never any ketchup. If you put ketchup on a Coney dog, you might get thrown out of the restaurant. Definitely a controversial condiment here. Definitely no ketchup. But I see ketchup behind. We that... sell french fries. When customers come to the carryout and want, you know, I'll have a Coney with everything. Every once in a while you get, okay, I want ketchup on mine too. We don't do it. We refuse to put the ketchup on the hot dog. And we've had people who got a little upset with us. I'm like, dude, I'm not putting ketchup on the hot dog. Your, your grandfather immigrates here from, from, from Greece. Greece. Why hot dogs? It was something that he had seen when he landed at Ellis Island in New York. He saw, you know, the amusement park. You gotta remember, he was a young man, came over with no money, I mean, borrowed a pair of shoes. He heard the automotive business was hiring in Detroit, made his way to Detroit, thinking they'll hire me even though I don't know how to read or write. They didn't. On this little corner right here where we are now, he started a little push cart. We're Greek, right? We know food. So grandpa remembered the hot dogs, made a Greek chili sauce. Our chili's a little unique. You hear about a Coney Island hot dog. You yes. think about Nathan's in New York City. But here's the difference. I'm going to stop you. OK. A Coney Island in New York is an amusement park right. that sells hot dogs. In Detroit, a Coney Island is the actual, it's the hot dog with the chili mustard onions on it. That's the difference. And I got a lot of heated arguments, people, about that. Really? In Detroit, it is the actual thing you're eating, thanks to my grandpa, because he named it American Coney Island. He was so grateful he was in America, and all the opportunities were given to him. Grace now in charge of carrying on the family legacy. It's obviously been passed from generation to yes. generation here. But each time you lose a member of the generation, it, it's got to be tough. You just lost your dad. Yes. Uh, not too long ago. Yeah, six months ago. When you come in, do you feel him here? I do. I, I, yes, I do. And I feel a sense of pride. I miss him a lot, obviously. But I, I just feel his presence. I feel everything he, he taught me. My grandpa did his thing. Then once my dad stepped in and took over, he took it to the next level. Then I took it to a whole nother level, with my brother self included. Grace's brother, Chris Soderopoulos, helps run the business today. There's an American outpost at the Detroit Zoo, plus a new location in Las Vegas. They're also shipping Coney kits all across the country. You get everybody yeah. from all walks of life, exactly. every demographic, every racial component, you nailed everybody it, comes here. Yes. The American Coney is the great equalizer. It, that's, I love the way you put it that way, Al. Exactly. We love the, our customers. I mean, our customers are like family. It's no joke. This is who made us. So we treat you like family. We don't know any different. Coming up, I learned how to make the quintessential Coney. One up. Right there. Nice shot. Yeah.
At American Coney Island, the oldest family-run Coney spot in Detroit, they keep things traditional. But you know, as I look at your menu, and I look at the pictures, they're uh, vi vintage, let's That's say. It doesn't look like you have strayed that much from the original menu. We haven't. I, I won't. Why add to it when it's working? You know what else is working? Me. I got behind the grill with Grace to prep the perfect plate of cones. This is the proprietary hot dog. If you notice the natural casing. Yes. It's a 90% beef, 10% pork with a lambskin casing. That's that, like three meats in one. You exactly. Get. Pork, beef, and a and That's lamb. That's right. And that's what makes it pop, like when you bite into it, oh, it snaps snap. like a party in your mouth. Yes. yes. That detail kept popping up everywhere we went. It's a warm bun, it's the, it's the snap of the hot dog. When you bite it, you hear that pop. You can tell it's a natural casing because when you bite it, it snaps back at you. The steamer bun. Ah. That's they, what we were taught. They're in a oh, steamer. You know, there's steamer. just enough steam in mm -hmm. here. So you're going to pull out the bun. Right. Look, look for the cut. Yep. So open it up a little, grab your plate. Yes. All right, so we're going to grab one. Right. Come over here. Do you want to top it or do you want to I want to watch the top. Okay, give it a little mix. Little, this is that. Little zhuzh. Greek, yeah, that's right. It gets a little messy. Some chili. Add a little more. You know, mm -hmm. be cheap with the chili. Greek spices. Yes. That's the magic. The secret spice blend? Well, it's secret. But the chili is made with ground beef. The tangy mustard. Tangy. Just a little lime. Nothing, nothing more. You take some onions, sprinkle them across, and there you go. Boom. Okay. 105 years. 105 years of magic. magic. My turn. Get a plate. I need one up, which means I one. need one for a customer. One for Everything a customer. Everything on it. Chili, mustard, onions. Get the split. Open it up a little more, El. A little All more. Right. It's not too bad. OK. <laughs> Boom. All right, now keep, I come over here. Keep the bun here. open because you want oh, the chili oh, to go in. Oh, you want the there. chili to go yeah, in. Yeah, you want the chili. You want it, yeah. I want that you chili. Don't chintz out on that yeah, chili. Little, don't chintz on the chili. Turn your dish a little so it's easier oh, for you to pour over there. All right. There. Oh, that really it does have a creamy See, consistency. See, it's really creamy, right. Exactly. And mustard. There you go. Ooh, that's heavy mustard. Did they order heavy mustard? Um, no, they didn't. <laughs> I, I'm making this for myself. <laughs> exactly. There you go. All right. One up. Ready. They are a nice shot. Yeah. Awesome. Woo. Good job, Al. Hey, now. Life-changing experience. Mm. It's magic in your mouth. Every great Coney needs a great bun, but not just any bun will do. A few miles from downtown Detroit is another family-run institution that's keeping the Coney tradition alive. 
What started as a small baking business is now one of the state's biggest suppliers of Coney buns. And that bun is the Coney Island Steamer. That's a good bun. The Coney Island Steamer is a six inch hot dog bun. At Metropolitan Baking Company, they like big buns and they cannot lie. The Coney Island Steamer bun is our flagship item on the bun and roll line. Not to mention, they claim to have buns of steel. These buns sit in a steam table. The product's formulated for that steam table. That bun is going to sit there and it's not going to fall apart on you when you load it with all those condiments. In Michigan, Coney dogs aren't just a tasty meal. They're big business. The Coney business gave rise to supplier industries just as the auto industry did. So we need to have a major bun maker here. The big maker nowadays is Metropolitan Bakery, and they bake these Coney dog buns with the sponge dough method. For three generations, the Cordes family, who also traced their roots back to Greece, has risen to the occasion selling specialty breads. Metropolitan Baking Company was founded by my grandfather in 1945. In the beginning, Metropolitan only sold simple loaves. Today, they produce dozens of items for grocery stores, high-end restaurants, and of course, Coney Diners. And while their products have changed over the years, a few names have truly stood the test of time. He was George James Cordes, uh, namesake, and my father is James George Cordes, and I'm George James Cordes. My father, just like me, was, was, was bred in the business. George credits his father for the company's massive expansion in the mid 80s. This summer, we're gonna be producing millions of Coney Island steamer hot dog buns. This abundance, pun intended, is all thanks to automation. Automation is, is really what transformed this company. We went from packaging maybe 10, 15 loaves of bread a minute to 140 loaves a minute. In 2001, after years of recipe testing, the signature steamer bun was added to the product line. It is a hot dog bun that we formulated to be used at the Coney Island restaurants um, in Metro Detroit specifically. This bun that we produce is in roughly 95% of all Coney Island restaurants. And it takes a lot of dough to make all those buns. So what we're doing right now, this is where it all begins. This is the mixing room, and we're about to create a 1,600 pound dough batch of hot dog buns. Major ingredients are gonna be flour is 65%, you know, then you've got your yeast, you've got your sugar, you've got your oil, you know, and a bunch of, bunch of proprietary ingredients. Any minute. That's um, roughly 1,200 packages of Coney Island Steamer hot dog buns. There you go, you did it. <laughs> that makes over 14,000 buns. After mixing, the dough gets cut into bun-sized portions. You're looking at three-foot sheets that were just guillotined, and now they're going into a smaller divider to be put into roughly uh, 1.25 ounce dough balls. Next up, time to proof. After 60 minutes, the dough has risen. And after about 10 minutes bake time, we're gonna have a fully baked hot dog bun that's prepared to cool. The buns are almost ready. The product's sliced you know, after the cooling conveyor, and then it's paddled on top of each other to create a 12 pack, a dozen buns. The baskets are headed down to logistics and ready to be set up for routes. Then it's off to stores in Michigan's finest Coney restaurants, including American Coney Island. While the factory may have a lot of machinery, George has always been hands-on. So I worked here every summer throughout high school and throughout college, almost every position. And you really learn what hard work is as a kid to work in a bread factory you know, when it's 110 degrees out. When Grandpa George started the company, he had fewer than 10 employees. Today, they've got almost 100. When they say employees, family, family employees, that's what John is. He's literally family. John Grabowski has worked with all three generations of the Cordes family. At 12 years old, he took a summer job washing buckets at Metropolitan. Today, he's the plant's lead engineer. It's like family. When you come to this business, everybody that's here, they feel like family to me. Everybody says hello to each other. It's a good camaraderie. Everybody likes each other. It's more than just bread and butter for the employees. 
it's really nice being run by family on business. It, you can come to work and feel like you're at home. It's like a second family to me. We all work together, we, you know, we get down in the dirt, you know, we exchange uh, all kinds of work habits and we learn from each other and we do the best we can. The longtime employees are proud, keeping Detroit's Coney tradition going strong. We all grew up eating Coney's, right? Comerica Park, you know, baseball games as a kid with mom and dad and grandparents, family time. Coney dogs go, that's a part of pretty much everybody's childhood. It's a joy to be a part of that heritage. Today, Metropolitan's running six days a week, 20 hours a day. The amount of product that we're sending out each day, from the first dough that's kicking out around 1.30 in the morning till the final package at 10 at night, I feel constant pride. As for the future, George's kids seem to have inherited his love for the bakery. My daughters, Cecile and Sloan, I, I bring them almost every Saturday. They actually tell me that they enjoy it more than Disney World. This is their favorite place on earth. Just like what it was for me as a kid that age. It's that joy and a family legacy that George hopes will carry on for many years to come. I absolutely love what we're doing here. I love our history. I never want to be that third generation cliche. You know, I want to continue the growth with my kids, They're my kids' kids, have them look back, family members and say, wow, that's incredible. Look at what you've done. Chili, mustard, onion. What happens if you reverse it? <laughs> oh, you're out. You're out. You're out. You're out. <laughs> Minutes from downtown is Detroit's Brush Park neighborhood. Folks here are flocking to enjoy the good vibes at this cool Coney spot. CMO may be relatively new to the game, but loyal fans can't get enough of their chili, mustard, and onions. CMO, get it? But unlike most diners in town, here, the Coney, the sauce, and everything else on the menu is powered by plants. My name is Pete Lacombe. I'm the owner of Chili Mustard Onions in Detroit, Michigan. You could say opening a vegan Coney spot in the Coney capital takes guts and grit. And that's exactly what this family's made of. I don't follow any rules. I follow the important ones, but I don't do what everybody else does. Pete and his wife Shelly, along with their daughter Darla, launching CMO in 2018. It's the first and only all vegan Coney spot in Detroit. I would say my wife gave me the biggest kick in the butt to go vegan, and we did. I had a vision that we were gonna open a vegan Coney Island, and I told Pete that, and he told me I was out of my mind. Pete and Shelly have enjoyed many a traditional Coney as lifelong Detroit residents. When Shelly and I got married, she used to tell me all the time that I was going to open a restaurant and it was going to be a vegan restaurant. And I said, yeah, I'm not vegan. So I asked her why she thought I was going to open a vegan restaurant. She said, you could never hurt an animal or sell animals. And I went, oh, you're so right. 
Now, the family's been vegan for over 10 years. It not only saved my life going vegan and saved my life by doing something I love, um, I got to do something I love every single day with the people I love. Before entering the restaurant business, Pete worked in the auto industry, just like his dad and his granddad. When I was in automotive design, I ate horribly. I smoked cigarettes, I drank a lot. It was just kind of the norm in that field. That was really in my blood, but it wasn't in my soul. Cooking was in my soul. Pete's true passion coming from spending time with family in the kitchen. So we lived really close to my grandparents and what was in my soul was food. I cooked with my grandmas all the time. My grandma, my mom's mom, really should have opened a restaurant. And um, I feel like I'm living that dream through her. That dream now possible with the next generation. So Darla's our manager and she takes care of the customers so well. And seeing the woman that she has become, we're so proud of her. My wife and I, we've been through so much. We're partners in crime, partners in life, partners in love. And partners in creating a home away from home for every customer. I created CMO, the interior, to reflect like my basement or my living room where you can come over and eat at my house. Everybody's welcome in my home. Every day, somebody wants to go tell him how fabulous this place is and how blown away they are with this food. Since it first opened, CMO has been delighting vegans and non-vegans alike with their take on hot dogs smothered in chili. The amount of love and emotion that is put into the food and every bite, you can tell that. I've never had vegan food, but it was really, really good. This just tasted so similar to it would as a, a regular Coney Island. You know, it's hard to come by something that's like so close to like a childhood favorite. Of course, I had to see if this Coney truly lived up to the hype. Hey, Al. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Welcome to my kitchen. Well, this is really cool. We've heard all about this. When you're used to something that is meat, yeah. you know, getting them to try something that doesn't quite fit what they think it's supposed to be. For me, I let my food speak. If I put something out there on a plate that is incredible, happens to be vegan, that, that changes minds and hearts and, you know, it's incredible. I see your, your, your wife and your daughter standing out there. Are they taste testers? Oh, my wife for sure, yes. That's love. It is, oh, it's love. <laughs> and we'll be married 30 years this year. Congratulations. So thank you. Let's make some vegan magic. Let's do that. The, the hot dog, what kind of protein is this? It's a pea and soy protein. And this is your chili. What's yes. The, now, what's the protein in here? For this chili? is Beyond uh, Crumble, uh -huh. a plain Beyond Crumble. A lot of Coney places are hush-hush about their chili, but Pete was willing to dish a little. How do you make your chili? I use a blend of spices, salt, pepper, garlic, onion, and a few other things that are top secret. <laughs> We're gonna throw that in our water. Okay. That's the hero right there. Right there. The spice is the hero. The chili's brought to a boil, then thickened with potato starch. It was time to try my first vegan coney. That's a healthy ladle. It is. I usually do a little more than that. Wow. So, yeah. Do a lot of onions. Here they are. Let's give that a shot. That's really good especially the chili. Thank you. How long did you have to work on the chili recipe? You know, I, I hit it right on the head when we first went vegan, mm -hmm. and then I didn't write it down. <laughs> <laughs> so then it took me about a year after that to really nail it down. But even with a winning recipe, times have been tough for CMO. What was the pandemic like for you guys? It hit us extremely hard, and we're still struggling and fighting, and you know, there's no quit in us, but it's been tough. Yeah. How's the future look for you? I really don't know. We're, we're trying. We're working every day, but I, I don't know what the future holds. I really don't. If it's based on the taste of that, your future's bright, my friend. Thank you so much. That I is good. It. Thanks so wow. much. Wow. The history behind Detroit's Coney Dog is truly an all-American tale, from the Greek immigrants who borrowed the name to a mashup of traditional flavors with a boardwalk staple. And now, there's a whole generation of locals who are ensuring that this regional hot dog is here to stay. Ah, the avocado. 
From toast topping to sweet treats, even mac and cheese, this tasty green fruit is pretty much everywhere. But did you know the most popular variety, the Haas avocado, was developed right here in Southern California. So I came all the way across the country to find out how farmers and restaurant owners are making sure we're enjoying these for years to come. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. We call this right here the avocado tunnel of love. <laughs> In the past 20 years, believe it or not, avocado consumption has tripled in the United States. Today, the average American eats eight pounds of these babies every year. I'm at Rancho Vasquez, one of the oldest avocado orchards in the country. Here, the Vasquez family grows several different varieties. Let's avocado check it out. Oh, welcome to Rancho Vasquez. Art? Yes, Nice Art. to meet you. How's it going, sir? Damien Vasquez. Damien, nice welcome to see to you range. guys. Army veteran Art Vasquez has turned his love for avocados into a true family obsession. Four generations live together on this scenic ranch. Many of them work in the orchard and help run the business. I've never been to an avocado farm. Wow. So uh, it'll be gonna, a lot of fun. You guys gonna give me a tour? Absolutely. All right, let's go. Art's grandfather, Refugio Morones, moved to the U.S. from Mexico in the 1920s. He picked avocados and citrus fruit on several farms, but always dreamed of having his own orchard. When Art was seven, the family purchasing their first acre of this ranch. And that's when my grandfather, Refugio, would start teaching me how to take care of the trees. That's when I, I really started loving picking. My brother and I would pick the avocados, take the avocados down to the town, knocking on doors, selling the avocados. Art put his passion for produce on hold to pursue a career in the auto parts industry. In 2002, he was able to buy the entire property, which was destined to be raised for new houses. We've taken it from 250 trees all the way up to 3,750 trees. This is something, a sustainable legacy that I can leave here and teach my children, grandkids, and the family how to work the earth how to grow things organically. Art had also saved a piece of Golden State history. Avocados are native to Mexico, but some of the first avocado trees in the U.S. were planted in L.A. County in the mid-1800s. Henry Dalton, a wealthy trader who owned ranches in California, fell in love with the fruit during trips to Central America. In 1848, Henry planted the first avocado tree in Azusa. So when he moved to Los Angeles and he took over and bought Rancho Azusa, he knew there was fresh water coming from the Azusa Canyon. And so because of having the fresh water source and the awesome soil, he knew avocados would be great here. During a tour of the ranch, I got to see a living part of that history. What makes it special is one of the first planted avocado trees in the Western United States. This puppy is one of a kind. It's like us, Al. It's one of a kind, okay. <laughs> and it's still producing fruit? Still producing fruit. It produces anywhere between 500 to six, 700 pounds of fruit a year. Experts estimate this tree is more than 100 years old. It produces a type of avocado known as the fuerte, in Spanish meaning strong. It was the first avocado variety to thrive in the United States because it can withstand cooler temperatures. But in the 1920s, a new variety emerged in SoCal that would ultimately dominate the world market. A guy by the name of Rudolf Haas, he was actually a postal carrier, but his hobby was growing. So he had an orchard at his house about 20 miles from here, La Habra Heights. The Haas avocado was a total accident. An amateur farmer, Rudolf had purchased some mystery avocado seeds. When the tree matured, he was surprised by the dark, bumpy fruit it produced. And that really took off commercially because it has a thicker skin. So for shipping purposes, and it's an amazing tasting fruit. The Fuerte and many other avocados stay green when mature, 
but the skin on a hasp turns black when ripe, hiding any bruises. It didn't take off right away among consumers in the U.S., so it took a few marketing campaigns for Americans to embrace this creamy variety of the fruit. This fourth, put a little green in your red, white, and blue. Today, 80% of avocados grown worldwide are Haas. Now here, this is one of the first Haas trees commercially ever planted. We've got two Haas trees right here. Until the 90s, the majority of avocados consumed in the country were grown in California and weren't available year round. But all that changed in 1994. President Clinton made NAFTA the law today, linking the United States to Canada and Mexico in one large trading block. When NAFTA passed, avocados from Mexico became available everywhere, and folks could enjoy them anytime. Today, even named avocado toast a top trend of the 2010s. Avocado toast. I'm not sure how this happened, but there came a time in the past 10 years when people began to realize that their lives were not complete without it. Thanks to clever campaigns, new diet trends, and an abundant supply, avocado consumption has boomed in the last two decades, growing into a multi-billion dollar industry. Now, 90% of those avocados come from Mexico. However, this has led to major environmental impacts, like deforestation. Rancho Vasquez wants to combat the negative effects of monoculture farming. As an organic orchard, they follow strict guidelines to help protect the land. How have the trees and what you grow tried to lessen the impact on the environment? We pick the weeds by hand. Are we weedy? Because it's all organic. Yeah. So we don't ever spray any weed killer or anything like that. The deer come and eat all the lower leaves and skirt the trees for us. Ah. And they turn that into natural manure. Now, when it comes to picking, avocados require a gentle touch. So we still do it the same high-tech way they did it 100 years ago. Wow. And this is my grandfather's pole? pole right here. Really? Yeah, this is one of the old school ones. So you can pick any of these you want. Okay. So yeah, you just slide it right up till the avocado goes in the basket, and then you pull on the rope. There you go, you're almost there. Pretty difficult, you're doing pretty darn Wait, good, you know? A little bit further, and then pull the rope. There you there go, you is. got it. <laughs> good job. <laughs> These are easy to catch. Ta-da! There you go, My that's first a nice avocado. one too. It's gonna take a week to a week and a half right now to ripen and let it get soft. How about going and tasting some? Yes, sir. We picked some about a week or so, so they'd be perfect for you. All right, let's do it. Believe it or not, there are more than 400 varieties of avocados. Rancho Vasquez in Azusa, California sells six. The Fuerte, Hass, Lamb Hass, Reed, Pinkerton, and Gem. Each has a different shape, taste, and growing season. I've never seen such a, like, a round avocado. The ranch's avocados are prized by chefs and customers for their high oil content. That comes from the area's climate, nutrient-rich mountain soil, and secret farming techniques that have been passed down for generations. The higher the oil content, the better the tasting fruit is. Mm -hmm. And then the longer it'll stay green. 
you can taste and see the difference with their organic hash. It just keeps it well, really fresh. You can literally fresh. see the oil coming out of it. Yeah. So if you want to try just a little chunk, we'll give you a little chunk. Oh, that's great. Next up, the family favorite, Fuerte. Oh, a real, really a different flavor. Absolutely, absolutely. There's almost, it's almost like a saltiness and a creaminess in there. Aside from his wife's guac, Art's favorite way to eat avos is actually with honey. Ooh. It's called avocado dulce, which is avocado candy. Oh my gosh. Oh, that's fantastic. Isn't it great? I would have never thought of that. Guys, this is just amazing. What does it mean for both of you to, to be owners of this, of this legacy? This is a legacy I do want to leave. My family, my grandkids, Damien, and this will be around for, I'm hoping and praying, for at least another 100 years, you know? And what does it mean for you, Damien? Oh, it's like you said, just a place where history can keep going. Because the trees were here before us, and they're gonna be here after us. So we're just kind of stewards of the land in the meantime. Let's share a little of this guacamole. Yes, sir. Yep. Let the chips fall where they may, as long as they've got guacamole on them. Avila's El Ranchito is a Southern California staple that's been in business for more than half a century. They've got 13 locations and counting of this family-run chain, but no two restaurants are exactly the same. Every Avila's owner puts their own spin on the family's traditional Mexican recipes. But here at the Seal Beach Outpost, they claim to have the best guacamole. Well, I've come to learn their secrets. It's time to guac and roll. Hey there, wow, got a lot of folks here. The aunts, uncles, siblings, and cousins behind Avalas El Ranchito really treat their guests like family. This location is run by Elise Avila Smith, a third generation restaurateur. She credits the family's success to her grandma Margarita's hospitality. You know, she just focused on really what we focus on good, fresh food. Salvador and Margarita, or Mama Avila, immigrated from Mexico to the U.S. in 1958. How did they get into the restaurant business? My father had an opportunity to buy a restaurant and talk to my mother and decided, you know, this is a great opportunity. Salvador using his life savings to purchase the old restaurant property in Huntington Park. He turned to his six kids, including Elisa's dad, Victor, for support. We would go after school and help them do whatever needed to be done. 
And my father was pretty much during the day taking care of the whole restaurant, and my mother was in the kitchen. So she was in the only one in the kitchen. And then, Grandpa Folder was well, washing yeah. dishes. Mama's traditional recipes have been passed down through many generations. They've come from way, way back in Mexico. When it first opened in 1966, Avila's was the only Mexican restaurant in the mostly white neighborhood. Many customers had no interest in Mama's traditional dishes, so she developed a strategy to draw people in. It seemed like natural for my mother to offer the people whatever they wanted, so mm. it was more like a home. If they didn't have it on the menu, then my mother would go in the kitchen and make it anyway. Over the next three decades, the Avila siblings opened six new restaurants in Southern California. This expansion wasn't a coincidence. Americans at the same time were falling in love with Mexican food. In the early 80s, there were an estimated 2,500 Mexican restaurants in the U.S. Today, there are more than 60,000. I was busting tables here as a child. <laughs> Elise witnessed that growth as a kid, watching her dad expand the family business. So I grew up doing homework in a booth. On top of that, I grew up with my grandparents living one street over from me. So I grew up cooking with her for years and years. After college, Elise tried working in other fields, but she was always drawn back to the restaurants. I'd be working by day, you know, I worked for a magazine. And then my brother opened his first restaurant and I ended up serving tables at night. So no matter what I did, I kept ending up back in this business and I loved it. I realized that this was my passion, it's in my blood. How do you qualify to open up a, an abla? Well, it's process, let me tell you. <laughs> Is it really? I had to work every position in the restaurant. So I washed dishes, I worked in the kitchen for a few years, but I've done it all. After proving herself for a decade, Elise opened her own Avalas in 2015. When I first opened my restaurant, I worked for several months from about six in the morning till midnight. And finally, I remember my dad and my brother came in for an intervention and said, you need to go home. You gotta sleep. <laughs> you gotta sleep. So I went home and they ran my restaurant for the night. And I knew with my dad and my brother here, there was nothing to worry about. Mm -hmm. Every Avila's restaurant is unique, reflecting the family member who owns it and the location. They have different decor and specialty menu items. Elise puts her own spin on the brand by offering an extensive tequila cocktail menu. Dad, I'm gonna make you a drink right now. Make it strong. <laughs> Salud, mija. Mm. But there are several dishes you're gonna find at every location. Avocados are crucial to many of the family recipes, including the signature guacamole and their beloved chicken soup. Tell me about Mama Avila's soup. It's that soup that feels like home to me, but it is a chicken breast and rice soup. We make it from scratch every morning, including the broth. We put fresh avocado, cilantro, onion, and tomato in it. And people go, and the first thing they do when they get off the plane is go to have some chicken soup. You mentioned avocado goes into the soup. Tell me about the importance of avocado. It's part of our culture. Bottom line is nobody wants to eat Mexican food without avocado and some guacamole. <laughs> so I'm curious, first you, Victor, what's the secret to a good guacamole? You have to make it, you know, almost really as on a daily basis, almost an hourly basis. It needs to be fresh. It needs to be well seasoned. And a little bit of love. I like to think I make a good guac, but I, <laughs> I'm sure I can learn from the best. So how about showing me how you guys do guac? Before making some guac, I enjoyed a cucumber margarita and got a taste of Mama's famous soup. That's great. I would never think about avocado in chicken soup. Oh my God. I can't take credit for that one, Al. That's all grandma. <laughs> all right, you ready to make some guacamole? You bet. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do, we're gonna dump some fresh garlic in here. Okay. This is a traditional mocha hete. From there, you're gonna sprinkle a little bit of salt just on top. Just a little, just bit, a little of salt. bit of love. And then you're gonna use the chop to go ahead and grind it in there. A mocha hete, a Mexican mortar and pestle, is made from volcanic rock. And it's the family secret to great guac. The rough surfaces help crush the ingredients, releasing their natural oils better than chopping them up with a knife. And we're gonna get in some fresh avocado. All right. And then you go ahead and mix that together. And I gotta be gentle with the oh, avocado soft. With, with some be love. Gentle, gentle. In go diced onions, lots of cilantro, and a good squeeze of lime juice. Keep on mixing there, and you got yourself some good, fresh guacamole. I'm gonna dig in here with you too, Al. 
Oh, yeah. You make good guacamole, Al. <laughs> I've learned from the best. Elise, to be part of something like this, what, what does it mean? Honestly, I feel compelled to keep these beautiful recipes that are from, gosh, my great-great-grandparents running so that everyone that comes to our restaurant is able to taste them and to sit at our table and feel like family and just be a part of ours. Cheers. The ceviche bar a little different from a, a sushi bar. It's like a sushi bar, but more Mexican. Uh huh. <laughs> this lively food court is home to several family-owned hidden gems. In fact, here you'll find Holbush, a modern eatery renowned for its sustainable seafood. The chef behind this vibrant menu pairs flavors from his childhood in Mexico with the freshest of California fare. Gilberto Satina never thought he would dedicate his life to cooking but his summers spent on the Yucatan Peninsula would later inspire a bold move. Since I was a teenager, growing up in a coastal region, I would go diving with my cousins. We would dive down for octopus, uh, we'd get lobsters, we'd get sea snails, and then he would take that back and cook it. And that was one of the first times that I felt a direct connection to food because even back then, there was a disconnect, you right. know? Food came from the supermarket. And it was the first time I saw something that was like directly from the sea and you can cook it and eat it right away. So that kind of blew my mind. Gilberto immigrated to the U.S. when he was five years old. His father, Gilberto Sr., a former civil engineer, worked various restaurant jobs to support the family. How did your family transition from that kind of grassroots sort of food service to right. a real formal restaurant? It, it really was through the help of the nonprofit that, you know, operates Mercado La Paloma. This bustling market is run by Esperanza, or Hope, a nonprofit dedicated to revitalizing South Los Angeles and helping first-time business owners. They gave us small business training, basic you know, restaurant health department training. They co-signed loans so my dad could purchase the equipment. It was my dad's dream to have a restaurant that represented our Mexican food, the food of the Yucatan, which is very distinct from other regions of Mexico. In 2001, Gilberto Sr. opened the family's first restaurant, Chichen Itza. The menu featuring traditional dishes like cunchinita pibil, salbutes, and panuchos. Lo empezamos la mamá de Gilberto y yo, o sea, mi esposa y yo. El, al principio éramos dos personas nada más. They needed help, but Gilberto was reluctant to join the family business. I didn't want to cook. I didn't want to be in the kitchen because I, I grew up in a household where we always, you know, cooking was always used to make ends meet, like a lot of, you know, immigrant families. So when we opened the restaurant and my dad asked me to come along and help him out for six months, I was front of the house. Slowly, I just discovered the cooking and that I enjoyed it and, you know, started learning from my dad. Even without formal training, Gilberto quickly learning the ropes, becoming a savvy businessman. Ten years in, 
Chichen Itza was thriving with dozens of employees. They even released a cookbook. Con el paso de los años, finalmente empezó a sentir la misma pasión que yo tenía por el negocio. After taking over at Chichen Itza, Gilberto was ready for a new challenge, one inspired by those summer boat trips in Mexico. Where does the name Holbox come from? So Holbox is a place. It's an island off the coast of the Yucatan Peninsula. He wanted to bring tropical, fresh from the sea vibes, along with an elevated experience, to diners in South Los Angeles. When Holbox opened in the same market, it changed many perceptions of what Mexican food could be. We go outside of the realm of Yucatan and we do food from all different coastal regions of Mexico. Gilberto's fusion dishes allow the freshest fish to shine. Menu staples include seasonal ceviches and an octopus taco. His innovative cooking has wowed locals and critics alike. How does it feel to be nominated for a James Beard Award for this? Mm. After the shock, I think the first thing that I felt was extreme pride in my team. To a certain level, I guess it feels a little bit like validation because we're doing something slightly outside of the box. You look across Mexican cuisine and, and one of the commonalities is the avocado. Why does the avocado work so well across cuisines in Mexico, but especially your cuisine? The pairing of avocado goes extremely well with raw seafood preparations like ceviches and cocktails, and they're very bright, light, and acidic. I think avocado is the perfect complement because it gives it a little bit, you know, creamy richness. That delicate balance is best represented in the shrimp and scallop aguachiles. And I couldn't wait to try making it. So aguachile is super simple. This is what we're going to do. We're going to take, we're going to make a marinade that's going to cook or denature our scallops, right? So we're just going to take some, some cilantro. Uh -huh. Next up, the chili. Serrano peppers bring the heat. Persian cucumbers cool it down. There's a pinch of salt, ice to prevent oxidation, and a squeeze of lime juice. Then the marinade blends for just about a minute. Now, we're just gonna take a bowl. Go ahead and put a couple of uh, spoonfuls of these beautiful Baja California Bay scallops. Ooh, look at those. Now, we're gonna pour the marinade and hold on to the spoon for a stirring. Perfect. It's about right. We want to let that marinate for at least five minutes. Gilberto takes his aguachile to the next level with an avocado rose. After pitting and peeling, it was time to get slicing. Your knife can be straight because your avocado is at an angle, and we're pull oh. cutting. You're just going to do this now. Look. Okay. The key to a great rose? Super thin slices. We're hiring, you know. <laughs> okay. Now the next step. Hands, right? This we're gonna do this this motion. We're gonna fan out the okay. avocado, right? Mm -hmm. So can you see that? Oh wow. Yeah, there you go. Looking good there. I think that's uh, good enough to roll. You're gonna start at the tip right here. Okay. And you just roll this one like that. You see how that's forming a really big flower? Yes. This is a pretty advanced skill, yeah. but I think it's one worth practicing. Oh, yeah. And it's a nice party trick, you know? Sure. Impress your friends. Yeah. So, which one should we use? I <laughs> think that one. Made by the professional. Time to plate it up. That's looking beautiful. You're a lot neater doing this than I am. I'll yeah. take like a spoonful of them and just yeah. drop it on there and then arrange them on the plate. Ah, pro tip. And of course, the finishing touches. Wow. This is our scallop aguachile. And I help make it. Can something this pretty taste as good as it looks? Mm, that looks like a good bite. <laughs> That's amazing. Thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. But yet so simple. Thank you, sir. Al, oh, it was a pleasure. Fantastic. The Haas avocado may have started out as a lucky surprise, but for decades, its popularity has been no accident. The Mexican-American culinary traditions passed down through the years have made this delicious and nutritious fruit a staple for so many of us across the country. And thanks to generations of enterprising families, this bumpy green fruit is going to have a very long shelf life.
In the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, black-owned restaurants weren't just places to get a meal, several becoming crucial meeting spots for activists at the forefront of the civil rights movement. And the families still operating these restaurants today are committed to honoring their historic legacy.